Good morning. Welcome to the International Connection. And it's a very special show this morning. This is the beginning of a journey we're about to take on this program. A journey into a gruesome world of mind control experiments by government finance doctors in Canada and the United States. Inhuman experiments performed on humans, children for the most part. For the next eight months, on the International Connection, we will be airing interviews with survivors of mind control experiments and ritual abuse, lectures and interviews with therapists, researchers and writers who are dealing with the legacy of mind control. Specifically, we'll be looking at the documented history of U.S. CIA and military mind control experimental programs. Also, the struggles of survivors to get compensation from the CIA and Canadian government, in particular for the government-funded mind control experiments at McGill University under Dr. Ewan Cameron. We'll be hearing the accounts of survivors of horrific experiments involving electroshock drugs, brain implants, sensory deprivation, psychic driving, forced sleep, ritual and sexual abuse. We'll also be discussing the mil military and intelligence uses of mind control, in including theft, assassination and sexual blackmail using the child victims. We'll be talking about the use of creating multiple personality disorder in people for mind control purposes and its links to the multiple personality effects of ritual abuse. We'll be discussing with therapists talking about the effects of severe trauma, sexual abuse, recovered memories, and the false memory syndrome. Many people listening may be aware of Dr. Kamen's projects at the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, but this wasn't the only location. The experimental projects were carried out all across Canada, and of course in the United States as well. The first segment of this radio series, Mind Control in Canada, features a lecture by Dr. Colin Ross to his colleagues about the history of the U.S. CIA and military mind control programs. Dr. Ross is a Canadian psychiatrist specializing in multiple personality disorder, currently practicing in Texas. He has researched this subject for many years and is currently writing a book about mind control. He has obtained thousands of CIA documents through the Freedom of Information Act, and through these documents, Dr. Ross is able to prove U.S. government has been using MPD and Manchurian candidates operationally since World War II, and it doesn't stop there. This lecture is part one of a three one-hour segment to kick off this radio series, Mind Control in Canada, on 88.1 CKLN. And now to Dr. Colin Ross. So, why am I uh, talking about this, and what is it that I'm going to try and say here? Well, one explanation is, nobody has the faintest idea what I'm talking about, and I'm here talking about it because I'm a little wacky. Hopefully, by the end of the day, that will be the conclusion. However, that is a conclusion that's been unhappily in print in various uh, esteemed locations such as British Journal of Psychiatry, Esquire magazine, uh, Richard Offshee's book, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation film. So it's been a very curious experience to go through this little journey that Kevin just alluded to, which is the same journey as we've all gone through who've heard anything about this from patients. And it starts off back in the remote past in 1981-85 when I'm a resident. I mentioned yesterday that in four years of medical school, four years of residency training, I had more multiple choice questions on lesh nyan syndrome, which just to remind you, as you all know, is an inherited deficiency of hypoxanthine guanine phosphovarbazole transferase. <laughs> I had more questions on that syndrome in my four years of medical school and four years of psychiatry than on childhood sexual abuse, and more teaching. So then somewhere in the course of the residency, I kind of get up to speed on dissociative disorders and connect them to child abuse and read the literature, get a little bit grounded. The avalanche of MPD cases starts for me um, late 85 into 86. And I think I've kind of a little bit got what's going on. And some person comes in and starts telling me about their father was killed by the mafia and they were taken to a mafia, a child prostitution brothel, and then they were involved in satanic ritual stuff. So I go, gee. No books, no literature, nobody's ever heard of it, nobody talks about it, totally in outer space, no idea what to do or which way to turn. I go to the Eastern Regional Conference, go to Chicago, find out a little bit, start getting a little bit grounded. And the first couple of cases, my personal reaction is, Gah, this sounds real, sure sounds real, could be real, it's pretty scary, wonder if I should let my kids out on Halloween or not. And then the sort of basic experience is, 
whatever percentage of satanic ritual abuse is actually real, it's clear that we got into some great big hysteria wave in society in general and in the profession. And a lot of people went a bridge or two too far on their journey, and we had to rein ourselves back in. So the, the time course now is, in my training, there's no sexual abuse at all. It doesn't exist. It's not relevant because it doesn't exist. Then it goes to, well, it exists, but it's not really all that relevant. And then there's this sort of outlier gadfly people are into dissociative disorders who aren't accepted by the mainstream. Then those dissociative disorders people, from a foundation of reality that was hidden, go off into outer space on this, uh, wasn't alien abductions, but was still outer space, satanic ritual abuse stuff. Then they sort of come back to Earth and get a little bit grounded. And next thing you know, it's all this government experiments, mind control stuff. So if you follow the pattern, what should be the case is, is just another hysteria wave. And the more you look into it, the more it'll just dissolve and we'll all settle down and we'll forget about it. Well, the pattern didn't work. Because when I started systematically looking into CIA and military mind control, the more I looked, the more solid reality there was there. And as you'll see, if we go through these slides and go through this talk, it's a completely different deal from satanic ritual abuse. Somewhere out there in the justice system, there may actually be objective evidence where somebody's actually busted a satanic ritual abuse cult. If there is, that information is not generally publicly available to any of us. It is a fact that we have not nailed down the existence of human sacrifice cults in North America if they exist. So it's all conjecture. Today I will prove to you completely locked down, documented, proven, beyond dispute or discussion, that intelligence agencies have been creating Manchurian candidates and multiple personality disorder for operational use since the Second World War. This is not a conspiracy theory, this is a fact. Now that's very amazing because if you took an opinion poll of all the psychiatrists in the American Psychiatric Association today, or you took the same poll five years ago, 99.99, there'd be maybe two outlier psychiatrists in the whole group who would say it's possible that Manchurian candidates are real. I mean, over 99% of psychiatrists would say it's fiction. We know the movie is fiction. Frank Sinatra did a good job. But there's just no way. It's absolutely impossible. This is a very, very, very strange phenomena that actually, this is in now in 1996, a completely documented fact. Uh, it's a very strange sociological little development in the field of psychiatry. How could that be possible? Well, I'm going to try and explain how it's possible today. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Also, I'm going to talk about not just creating Manchurian candidates, but the whole network of mind control doctors that's involved in this and supports this, and this kind of old boy network that maintains all of this. And you'll see a whole bunch of slides with godzillion interconnections between them that I'll go into in detail. And every one of those steps, unless I otherwise specify, every one of those steps is completely documented absolutely objective and full. So there's something real peculiar about just the whole story. It's a very strange story. It tells us that there's something going on in our culture and in the mental health field that is hidden and secret. This is another kind of incest secret in the field of psychiatry, that all of these people who have been running psychiatry in the latter part of the 20th century are either directly or loosely connected in to whole huge universe of covert, hidden, secretly funded mind control research. Then, as I emphasized, that's a fact. Now, why should we be talking about that at this conference? Well, it's obvious. If, in fact, experimental multiple personality disorder has been created and has been tight and hard and real enough for operational use by intelligence agencies for the last 50 years, this is something of interest to the dissociative disorders field. This is profound evidence in favor of the iatrogenic pathway to dissociative identity disorder that I talked about this morning. When I combine the expert witness experience I've had a clinically created iatrogenic DID using the techniques of destructive psychotherapy cults and course of persuasion, as I described this morning, when I take that expert witness evidence and see those cases created out of a base of no pre-existing dissociative disorder, and then I go to this CIA military mind control literature, my only possible conclusion is, yes, you can create full tilt DID artificially from ground zero. Also, I have to conclude that you can create any 
degree, complexity, permutation, combination of false memories you want. There is absolutely no limit on the quantity, complexity, reality, congruence, plausibility of false memories that you can insert in somebody's mind, wittingly or unwittingly. So they didn't tell me that in medical school. So this is a little sub-paradigm revolution in the dissociative disorders field. There's a huge wealth of information, experimental information, clinical anecdotal information, and operational street smarts knowledge of dissociative disorders that's been up and running and present full tilt in the mental health field for 50 years now. This did not spring out of nowhere in 1980. And we are missing a ton of experimental research data that's still classified that bears directly on this false memory debate that's going on in our society now. And you'll see some of the players in this uh, whole scenario are interesting people. If we could put the slide projector on. What I'm going to do is run through a few slides now. There's a series of slides now, then we're going to stop and I'm going to read some passages and then we'll go back into the slides. Every slide that I will show you is in your handout packet so you don't have to take notes on that information. Anybody who's listening to the tape, there's also a few examples of the documentation uh, in your materials after the slides. Anybody who has ordered the tape and wants to get that information can call me at Charter Hospital in Dallas at 1-800-255-3312 and we can just mail that to you. So the first point, I'm just going to zip through these slides kind of quickly. The first point is that there are a lot of documented declassified mind control research programs that are completely objectively proven. They're beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I have a lot of this material, and some of it I have on order. So the first, this is CIA now, uh, Bluebird and Artichoke were two programs that ran from 1951 to 53. And I'll read you some stuff from Artichoke in a minute. MK, these were then rolled over into MK Ultra, which ran from 1953 to 1963. And then there's 149 sub-projects that you'll see a listing of in a second. That then was administratively rolled over into MK Search, which ran up till 1973. Uh, contiguously with that, and in collaboration with uh, Edgeware Arsenal, MK Naomi, which involves uh, MK Ultra and Artichoke and Bluebird type research done uh, abroad and nationally, ran from 1953 to 1970. And this in all involves all kinds of hallucinogens and hypnosis and so on that I'll go into in detail. Stargate is um, just recently declassified ESP paranormal remote viewing uh, military uses of telekinesis type research that was done from an uncertain start date up until 1984. Bill Gates, former director of the CIA, on uh, ABC's uh, Dateline in December 95 said that it ran up till 1984. They had one of the academic contractors to Stargate on the show and they had the man whose job was CIA oversight of military experimentation under Stargate. So this really went on. They really used psychics operationally and they believed in enough to keep spending millions of dollars on it for several decades probably. Now when you uh, read all the Senate materials and from the 70s and read all the existing literature, the claim of the intelligence community is that all of this mind control research stopped in 1973 due to uh, Senate oversight and so on. One of the uh, MK Ultra sub-projects is on the paranormal, ESP and using ESP for covert operations purposes. That element of MK Ultra didn't stop in 1973. We now know from the CIA itself that it ran on until 1984. So we know for a fact that at least that element of this mind control research program that was said to have stopped in 73 continued to 84. And my position is that it's simply implausible that this stuff isn't ongoing up to the present. You'll see from this list, Project Chatter, Project Often, Darby Hat, Third Chance, Chickwit, MK Delta, and QK Hilltop, that there was a large number of different programs in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, all of which uh, have just a little tidbit of information about them. Most of the actual documents and so on, uh, nobody's either reviewed and nobody's obtained through the Freedom of Information Act yet. So this is a huge amount of as yet still classified information. Okay, now I'm just going to give you kind of a, a smattering run through of the institutions that were sites for MKUltra research. So MKUltra, there was 149 different sub-projects in MKUltra. And 
these were not in obscure little corners of the world. See, there's American Psychological Association. This is a Butler Hospital and Health Center as part of uh, Harvard. Children's International Summit Villages is a very charming place. This was a project involving a study of children at an international summer camp, age 11. And the study was to determine how children who don't share a common language communicate. And in the CIA materials, it states that the investigator was unwitting of the fact that it was CIA funding. And the purpose of the CIA interest in these 11-year-olds was that they might possibly identify promising uh, young foreign nationals for future use by the agency. Columbia University, Cornell, Denver, Emory, Florida, George Washington, Harvard. Let's just give you a feel for who's involved in this stuff. Houston, Illinois, Indiana Universities, Johns Hopkins, Eli Lilly was the big supplier of LSD to the CIA. Those of you who uh, can remember the 60s, remember the House of the Rising Sun by the British rock group The Animals? They had a song called A Girl Named Sandoz. Sandoz was the employer of Hoffman who uh, discovered LSD in the 1940s. Sandoz was the original supplier of uh, LSD to the CIA and the military in the 1950s. And they wanted to secure American supply, so they contracted with Eli Lilly to become the developer. Uh, University of Minnesota, New Jersey Reformatory of Bordentown, you're going to see it a bunch of times on subsequent slides. Ohio, you know, University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, Princeton, Stanford, a couple of universities in Texas, Wisconsin, the Bureau of Narcotics, a prison, a narcotics farm. So these contracts, uh, McGill, NIH, NIMH, National Philosophical Society, everybody gets in on the act a little, NRC. So these were all of the major players in North American psychiatry and psychology who were receiving this kind of funding. Uh, Office of Naval Research, which is you're going to see multiple times on the slide, Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology, all kinds of different agencies and groups. MK Search is the one that MK Ultra was rolled into, ran from 63 to 73, again, Bureau of Narcotics. New Jersey Neuropsychiatric, which was also an MKUltra site, and I'll talk about more detail. Vacaville State Prison, you're going to hear a whole bunch about. Now, Bluebird and Artichoke, which were 51 to 53, institutions there include Bureau of Narcotics, Cornell, Eli Lilly again, NIH, Public Health Service, University of Minnesota. So you get the idea. Now, what about the, the proven identity of some of the actual contractors? The terminology here is uh, we've got the contractor, then we've got the subproject number, and I have uh, most of these, I actually have the subcontract files. And security status, mean, TS means top secret, cleared, and UW means unwitting, because this money was usually put through a funding fund, uh, and you'll see a slide on all the way that was all organized. So the person could get CIA money through the funding front and genuinely not know that it was CIA money, we just think it was another foundation. Most of these people you haven't heard of, like James Hamilton and Harold Abramson and Carl Pfeiffer, but you'll hear more about them later today. But some of these people might sound a little bit familiar. Louis Jolyon West, who's at UCLA. Ewan Cameron, who was in McGill, has been written about a lot. And uh, yes, this is Carl Rogers of Rogerian psychotherapy fame. He was actually a uh, spook psychiatrist with top secret clearance who was on the advisory board of one of the funding fronts and received funding for psychotherapeutic research on schizophrenia. It's a very funny thing that Mr. Friendly Carl was in network. Uh, Martin Oren, you'll hear a lot about him. These people were at the University of Oklahoma, and they were doing research on street gangs. Four of the MKUltra subprojects were on children, and all of the investigators for those were unwitting. Uh, Martin Oren's top secret clearance status. Maitland Baldwin is a neurosurgeon who did uh, stuff on monkey brains. Uh, George White was a CIA career officer who constructed safe houses in San Francisco and New York where uh, people were recruited in off the street to have sex with prostitutes and were given uh, LSD and other drugs without their knowing it. The rationale for this is that they're attempting to study reaction of unwitting subjects in civilian settings to mind control drugs. An alternative hypothesis is that they were actually testing Manchurian candidate prostitute performance. Uh, 
uh, Harold Wolf was uh, at Cornell. Raymond Prince, of course, bonded with. He's an unwitting guy who did uh, research amongst the Yoruba in Nigeria on their folk healing practices. Uh, R. Gordon Wasson, I was a little bit unhappy to see him on the list, but relieved to see he was unwitting because I read a book of his called Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality, a long time ago, which is a very interesting book on fly agaric, which is that little red toadstool with the white flakes on it. Called It's technically called Amanita muscaria. And the use of that by circumpolar shamans is very interesting history. Uh, John Mulholland's actually a magician. And when you go through all these documents, all these names are whited out. You've got to piece it together from here and there, and it's a great big story trying to track it all down, except uh, they goofed up. John Mulholland's name was not whited out, whited out once. Yeah, not ascertained, right? When you when you get a file on one of these sub-projects, there's usually a page in there that has standardized wording about uh, no individuals associated with this project are witting, or uh, so-and-so whose name is whited out has top re secret clearance and is aware of agency involvement. Uh, there's somebody you've probably heard of. His name is B.F. Skinner. I'm still doing some of the archival research to figure out what his sub-project number is and what his security status is, uh, but I would suspect it'll turn out to be top secret. Okay, now just before we get to that slide, I'm going to read you some material, some of which is in your handout. As you can see, these slides are going to show you an awful lot of connections between an awful lot of different things here. But you get the gist of there was a lot of sub-projects, a lot of different investigators all over mainstream academia. Now I want, I'm going to jump to proving to you that multiple personality disorder has been created by the CIA and the military since the Second World War. And the first stop-off point is at the back of your series of handouts there. It's a, a publication called Science Digest, April 1971. The author is G. H. Estabrooks, E. S. T. A. B. R. O. O. K. S. And the article is called "Hypnosis Comes of Age." So, when you go to page 48, it is on there. I'm going to read this out loud for benefit of people listening to the tape. He's now writing in 1971, and he says the following: One of the most fascinating but dangerous applications of hypnosis is its use in military intelligence. This is a field with which I'm familiar through formulating guidelines for the techniques used by the United States in two world wars. For those of you who are not history buffs, that means at least back to 1914. Communication in war is always a headache. Codes can be broken. A professional spy may or may not stay bought. Your own man may have unquestionable loyalty, but his judgment is always open to question. The hypnotic courier, on the other hand, provides a unique solution. I was involved in preparing many subjects for this work during World War II. One successful case involved an Army Service Corps captain whom we'll call George Smith. Captain Smith had undergone months of training. He was an excellent subject, but not realize it. I had removed from him by post-hypnotic suggestion all recollection of ever having been hypnotized. First, I had the Service Corps call the captain to Washington and tell him they needed a report on the mechanical equipment of Division X headquartered in Tokyo. Smith was ordered to leave by jet next morning, pick up the report, and return at once. These orders were given him in the waking state. Consciously, that was all he knew, and it was the story he gave his wife and friends. Then I put him under deep hypnosis and gave him, orally, a vital message to be delivered directly on his arrival to J in Japan to a certain colonel. Let's say his name was Brown, of military intelligence. Outside of myself, Colonel Brown was the only person who could hypnotize Captain Smith. This is locking. I performed it by... Uh, I've had patients talk to me about locking. I performed it by saying to the hypnotized captain, until further orders from me, only Colonel Brown and I can hypnotize you. You will use a signal phrase, the moon is clear. Whenever you hear this phrase from Brown or myself, you will pass instantly into deep hypnosis. When Captain Smith is reawakened, he had no con was reawakened, he had no conscious memory of what happened in trance. All that he was aware of was that he must head for Tokyo to pick up a division report. On arrival there, Smith reported to Brown, who hypnotized him with the signal phrase. Under hypnosis, Smith delivered my message and received one to bring back. Awakened, he was given the division report and returned home by jet. There I hypnotized him once more with the signal phrase, and he spilled off Brown's answer that had been dutifully tucked away in his unconscious mind. The system is virtually foolproof. As exemplified by this case, the information literally was locked in Smith's unconscious for retrieval by the only two people who knew the combination. The subject had no conscious memory of what happened, so couldn't spill the beans. No one else could hypnotize him, even if they might know the signal phrase. 
Not all applications of hypnotism to military intelligence are as tidy as that. Perhaps, now here he makes a scholarly mistake, because he's talking about Morton Prince's uh, The Dissociation of a Personality, and he refers to the book The Three Faces of Eve. Perhaps you have read The Three Faces of Eve. The book was based on a case reported in 1905 by Dr. Morton Prince of Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard. He startled everyone in the field by announcing that he had cured a woman named Beecham of a split personality problem. Using post-hypnotic suggestions to submerge an incompatible childlike facet of the patient, he'd been able to make two other sides of Mrs. Beecham compatible and lump them together in a single cohesive personality. Clinical hypnotists throughout the world jumped on the multiple personality bandwagon as a fascinating frontier. By the 1920s, not only had they learned to apply post-hypnotic suggestion to deal with this weird problem, but also had learned how to split certain complex individuals, very interesting phrase, into multiple personalities like Jekyll Hyde's. The potential for military intelligence has been nightmarish. During World War II, I worked this technique with a vulnerable Marine lieutenant I'll call Jones. Under the watchful eye of Marine intelligence, I split his personality into Jones A and Jones B. Jones A, once a normal working Marine, became entirely different. He talked communist doctrine in minutes. He is welcomed enthusiastically by communist cells, was deliberately given a dishonorable discharge by the Corps, that's called sheep dipping, is a technical term for that, which was in on the plot and became a card-carrying party member. The Joker was Jones B, the second personality, formerly apparent in the conscious Marine. Under hypnosis, this Jones had been carefully coached by suggestion. Jones B was the deeper personality, knew all the thoughts of Jones A, was a loyal American and was imprinted to say nothing during conscious phases. All I had to do was hypnotize the whole man, get in touch with Jones B, the loyal American, and I had a pipeline uh, straight into the communist camp. It worked beautifully for months with this subject, but the technique backfired. While there was no way for an enemy to expose Jones's dual personality, they suspected it and played the same trick on us later. Okay, so now the only question becomes is, is Esther Brooks some sort of kook? Maybe he didn't really do this, maybe he's grandiose or delusional or just bullshitting or whatever. So let's take a look at who G.H. Estabrooks is. How are we going to do that? We're going to talk to a JFK assassination researcher who tells us that Estabrooks' personal papers are all uh, at Colgate College in Hamilton in Upper State, New York, that there's a whole bunch of boxfuls of all his personal papers, his correspondence and files and so on. So what we'll do is we'll send our secretary up there for five days to go through those 17 boxes, which are unindexed, unresearched and unpublished in any form and then we'll request a bunch of that material to be photocopied we'll bring it back to our office in Richardson we'll look at it and then we'll talk about it in Orange County later on and what we find is J. Chester Brooks was born in uh, Newfoundland in Canada so he's already suspect because he's Canadian <laughs> he's not really uh, too dumb he's a Rhodes Scholar he ends up uh, studying, I'm pretty sure, under Gardner Murphy at Harvard, takes a Ph.D., and uh, spends really his entire adult professional career at this obscure Colgate uh, College in Upper State, New York. So is he just an isolated kook, or is he connected in in any way? Well, as I'm going through all this military mind control research in the library, I'm aware that Martin Orn, who we'll get to in a while, is one of the people I really want to focus in on. And I notice in Mart one of Martin Orne's papers that he's referenced G. H. Esterbrook's 1943 textbook, which I've read, where he describes creating Manchurian candidates for the military. So I know that Martin Orne's aware of G. H. Esterbrook's claim to have created multiple personality disorder. Can I establish any better connection than that? Well, lo and behold, I find out that G. H. Esterbrook's edited a book to which Martin Orne contributed a chapter. Okay, so now Martin Orne is like totally connected into the whole picture, as you'll see later. But if you go to uh, a couple of pages ahead of that material I just read, you'll see a letter from G. H. Estabrooks dated August 22, 1961. Uh, Dear Martin, I am sending to thee a special delivery, one halo, pure gold, one pair of wings, which you can try on for size, and a credit card for use in the hereafter. Your article is, of course, excellent. Upon receipt of your letter, I immediately called Middendorf, and he informed me before I could even broach the subject that they would, of course, grant your request for reprints. Someday I'm going to have myself examined and find out why I do not consider these matters before I embarrass my friends. By the way, I'll be at the APA meetings Friday and Saturday, September 1st and 2nd. Then I'll have to whip back here and head south. If at all possible, I will be up at the Biltmore. If you and Ron, which is Ron Shore, are anywhere in the vicinity, 
let us sit down and yak at each other. I'm not overlooking the fact that our meeting at Cambridge with yourself and Ron sort of crystallized an idea in my mind. I had a wonderful month vacation in Canada, Toronto, Ottawa, Quebec City, Murray Bay, St. John, New Brunswick, and home. We particularly liked the French country. My wife's native language is French, although she speaks Italian, English, and German as well. I find that with her along, the red carpet is literally rolled out, and we see corners of the back country where they would set the dogs on me if I happened to turn up alone. Thank you tremendously. Hope to see you at the APA. My best regards to Ron. So it seems that these guys knew each other. Now if you turn over to the next page, Colgate University Symposium on Hypnosis, April 1st to 2nd, 1960 in Hamilton, New York. Opening address by G.H. Esterbrook's chairman. Speakers are E.R. Hilgard, author of the Neo-Dissociation book, which is a foundation of the entire field here, member of the DSM for Dissociative Disorders Committee. Uh, Ron Shore, frequent co-author with Martin Orne. Uh, Gorton, I don't know. Seymour Fisher, I've seen his name uh, going through different stuff. Wolberg, I've seen his name around. He's a behavioral guy, I think. Martin Orn, J. Chester Brooks. Oh, who's that guy? Oh, Milton Erickson. Yeah, I've heard of him. So this J. Chester Brooks is not just some isolated kook. He's a pretty connected in, well-known guy. And all the luminaries in hypnosis in this part of the 20th century know him personally, are corresponding with him on a friendly basis, and are coming to workshops he put on and publishing in books he's edited. So, so much for the isolated kook theory. Well, maybe he just kind of was bragging a bit and he wasn't really connected to the military. Well, bad news. A couple of pages back, you see on stationery of the War Department Office of the Secretary of Washington, D.C., dated February 20th, 1942, name George H. Estabrooks, Nature of Action, Accepted Appointment expert consultant to the Secretary of War without other compensation with the payment of actual transportation expenses and not to exceed $10 per diem in lieu of subsistence and other expenses. So he definitely had military intelligence appointment in the Second World War. Turn over the next page, now we've got Navy Department Naval Research Laboratory, Washington, D.C. From the Director of Naval Research Laboratory to Professor G.H. Estabrooks via Inspector of Naval Material, Syracuse, New York, subject information on military uses of hypnosis, semicolon request for, enclosed three copies of receipt for classified matter and return addressed envelope. One, the Naval Research Laboratory has received a request for information regarding the possible military uses of hypnosis. This request comes from a naval officer who is primarily interested in hypnosis as a possible facilitator of training, but also wishes to know about any other uses that may have been tested. Members of the psychology branch of this laboratory have discussed the matter informally with several psychologists versed in hypnosis including Dr. Robert White of Harvard University. Dr. White, which is where Martin Orne did his residency, Dr. White thought that you had done some experimental work on the question during the war and requested that the Naval Research Laboratory communicate with you. If you have done any work along this line, will you please let us know the purpose and results of your investigations? We have been unable to find any mention of such a project in the Washington files of the Armed Services, and so we must trouble you directly for information. Thank you for your consideration of this inquiry. So we know that we've got uh, very secret documents which are not readily available to usual classified military personnel looking through their own filing system. So we know he's not an isolated kook, we know he had a military appointment, we know he's connected in to all the major hypnotists, and we know that he's claiming from 1943 through to 1971 to have created Manchurian candidates successfully for operational use in the Second World War. Is there any other correspondence that might bear on the reality of his claims? Well, there's a whole bunch of correspondence back and forth from spanning the 1930s to the 1960s, that is spanning four decades, between him and some guy called J. Edgar Hoover. So you'll see on Federal Bureau of Investigation Stationery, July 12, 1939, Dear Dr. Esther Brooks, Permit me to acknowledge receipt of your letters of June 19th and 27th and July 6th, 1939. I read with great interest the hypothesis which you put forth concerning the sinking of submarines. I realize, of course, and this was a military use of hypnosis scheme for sinking submarines, I realize, of course, that you are only suggesting things that could conceivably happen upon the basis of your experiments and the experimentation of others, and you are not suggesting that such a situation actually did occur in any of the recent submarine disasters. <laughs> 1962. Dear Dr. Esterbrooks, your letter of February 27th with enclosures has been received and it was good of you to advise me of the symposium you have scheduled. 
I appreciate your inviting us to participate. However, the pressure of official business will not permit me to designate a representative to intend. Now, in between those two letters, there's massive correspondence back and forth between uh, J. Edgar Hoover and Esther Brooks. There's visits of FBI personnel to S. Brooks. There's many military and uh, FBI psychological warfare personnel attending various workshops and symposia of Esther Brooks. And there's overt discussion of uh, offenses, uses of hypnosis in clandestine operations. So from this, I conclude that probably J.H. Esther Brooks actually did create multiple personality disorder in the Second World War, and an awful lot of people knew about it. Okay, well, maybe it was just G.H. Chester Brooks and that was the end of the story. We've got to have some other body of evidence that indicates that this continued beyond the Second World War. And this is material that's not in your packet, that's from this uh, Operation Bluebird and Artichoke, CIA mind control research from 1951 to 53. And I'm just going to read you some uh, Artichoke and Bluebird documents that I obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. A lot of stuff is whited out, so I'll just say a blank whenever it's necessary to do so. To the files. On 6th April 1954, Tuesday, SI and H, I haven't figured out what SI is, H means hypnosis, experimentation, and research was carried on in Building 13 with the following subjects present. Mrs. Blank, Blank, and Blank, in addition to Messrs. Blank, Blank, and Blank, attended in a consultant capacity. Uh, one of these misses was age 19 according to the documents. The session opened with a slow induction for all hands and then a subsequent reinduction for Miss Blank to enable her to reconstruct a strange dream she had had the previous week. This was successful, although in the wake state she could, not, she could remember no details. The major experiment of, this evening, of the evening was then conducted as follows. Miss Blank was taken to room 23 under full hypnosis and she was instructed by the writer that she would find a secret document in or on Mr. X, uh, his desk in the room. She was told that she was to conceal this document next to her person and then return to room 21, operations room, pour herself a drink of water, which she would find on the bookcase, and stretch out on the sofa, face down, and go into a deep sleep. She was instructed she would not awaken under any circumstances. She was told she would only awaken if someone whispered to her a specific code word and would recall nothing except sleeping on the couch. Blank performed the entire test in exact detail as outlined above and had no subsequent memory whatsoever of any of this activity. During the experiment, Blank was taken to the same room by Blank, and she was told that a person, whom she had never seen, had taken a secret document from the agency. She was told that this person or the suspected person had been given a drug and was unconscious on the sofa in room 21. She was told she was to enter the room and find the document, which would probably be on the person on the sofa. She was given specific instructions that she must locate the document. She was told if she found the document, to conceal it on her person and return to room 23, sit in the chair and go at once into a deep sleep. She was further told she would have no memory of anything except falling asleep. Blank complied in specific detail and immediately discovered the document in Blank's sweater sleeve. Blank concealed the document on her person, returned to room 23, and at once went into a deep sleep. Subsequently, she was brought back into the operations room, and she and Blank were awakened. The experiment was carried off successfully, particularly by Blank, who had entire amnesia for the work and could not even recall it under hypnosis. Blank, however, was able to remember certain parts, although some of her details seem vague. Because here's another separate artichoke document. Uh, three, agents might be given cover stories while under hypnosis and not only learn them faultlessly but believe them. Every detail could be made to sink in. The conviction and apparent sincerity with which an individual will defend a false identity given as a post-hypnotic suggestion is almost unbelievable. One's memory for detail under such conditions appears to be boundless. Analogous case number three. A CIA security office employee was hypnotized and given a false identity. She defended it hotly, denying her true name and rationalizing with conviction the possession of identity cards made out to her real self. Later, having had the false identity erased by suggestion, she was asked if she had ever heard of the name she had been defending as her own five minutes before. She thought, shook her head, and said, that's a pseudo if I ever heard one. Apparently, she had a true amnesia for the entire episode. Four, hypnosis would permit the recruitment and handling of high-level political action agents, in particular, under ideal control. Convictions could be reinforced, political courses suggested, appointments influenced, and with a really good subject, only the imagination and skill of the handling operator and the inherent limitations of hypnosis as a technique would limit the possibilities. Double agents could both be discovered and used with much higher degree of assurance if hypno hypnotic control sufficient to permit regression were operative. They could be given suggestions which would have the force of true compulsions to tell of approaches made, targets, briefing, true identity, etc. There is also the possibility that such persons could be used under control much stronger than any we now possessed. And 
No, so that's experimental use. It's clearly creation of Manchurian candidates. There's no question whatsoever. This is now operational use on the United States. Two director of security. Uh, this is not Manchurian candidates, but it's uh, use of sodium amethol and hypnosis for creation of amnesia barriers and insertion, deliberate insertion of false memories. Two director of security via dir deputy director of security via chief security research staff from blank. Subject, report of artichoke operations 20 to 23 January 1955. Between Thursday 20 January and Sunday 23 January 1955, the SO, which means security office, artichoke team, conducted a special operation blank. In the opinion of team members and participating case officers of the blank, the artichoke operation was successful. Details follow. It should be noted at this point that because these operations were the first artichoke operations undertaken in the United States, which is a violation of the CIA's charter, the full names of those participating are admitted from this report and will not be revealed without consent of the security office. First names, titles, or pseudonyms will be used throughout this report. In view of the highly sensitive nature of the artichoke techniques and in view of the fact that this was the first artichoke operation carried out in the United States, the operation was conducted blank. This safe house is far removed from surrounding neighbors in a large tract of land and is thoroughly isolated. A limited and security cleared household staff maintained functions of the house and messing was by unwitting blank Actual artichoke operations were, as usual, carried out in a special area on the second floor of the house, and neither the household staff nor the blank were permitted in the area during any of the processing. SSD division furnished one security officer during the entire period of the operation to act as special guard and to handle any unusual situations which were arose during the operation. This guard is here and after referred to as blank in this report. For a matter of record, it should be noted that the subject was not a confinement problem and has been at all times fully cooperative. Guard detail was not present in connection with the subject except in a general sense. Technical matters in the case were handled entirely by the TBPSD under the personal supervision of blank. Full tape recordings were made of the entire case and tapes are to be turned over to the participating division in the immediate future. It should be noted that during this particular operation, a special device was used in uh, conjunction with the recording. This device, which is easily concealable, worked with remarkable efficiency and at no time during the entire recording was there any break due to technical failure. It should also be noted that a complex two-way transmitting receiving unit was again used in this artichoke operation. Cover for the actual operation followed standard procedure. The subject was informed in general terms that before being sent for further work, it was necessary that certain tests be made on him physically and psychologically for our protection as well as his. Hence, a complete physical and psychiatric psychological examination was required. The subject readily accepted this medical cover and the artichoke technique was introduced easily and with full consent of the subject. The case. Prior to the actual commencement of artichoke operations, a number of conferences had been held with the various participating personnel involved. All hands had been briefed and procedures had been worked out. A general time schedule was prepared and operating instructions for artichoke were issued. On the afternoon of 20 January, the subject and case of her blank, they were met blank of the interested division. Under a covert car, subject was taken to the blank, arriving there at approximately 9.30 p.m. Prior to this, that is during the day of Thursday, 20 January, the technical equipment had been checked out and installed and blank had arrived at the covert area at approximately 8 p.m. for operational purposes. By previous arrangement, the blank was picked up by blank at approximately 9.30 p.m. Blank was brought to the safe house at 10.50 p.m. Shortly after the arrival of blank, a preliminary conference began at approximately 11.10 p.m. with the subject. The interrogation lasted until 12.25 when all except the subject blank left the operations room. Tape recording was cut off at this time. As a result of this interview, Blank stated that the subject's mental and physical condition was good and noted that the pulse, which is actually the blood pressure, at 12.25 p.m. was 120 over 80. So these guys are not total wizards. The doctor also commented he had noted an increased amount of talk after a drink of whiskey, and although there was some nervousness present, it was not excessive. Blank stated he had given subject two grams of pentobarbital to use in assisting the subject to sleep, and it was later confirmed the subject had taken these prior to going to sleep. Uh, half paragraph is whited out. Because of the successful penetration, and because of the extremely high quality of information with the subject which the subject was obtaining, the case is regarded as most sensitive and important by the participating division. Since the subject's information had been checked and cross-checked many times by the operating division's case officers, and division was of the uniform opinion that the subject was fully legitimate and fully cooperating with our efforts. They, however, desired Artichoke to give added assurance to the subject's story and to help them determine absolute suitability for further use of the subject in his work. For the record, it should be noted that no polygraph techniques had been applied in this case since a physical examination in blank by apparently a cleared physician had indicated too much nervousness for successful polygraph testing. 
Following established patterns and using medical cover as explained above, the blank began the physical psychological examination at 10 a.m. on the morning of Friday, 21 January. This examination continued until 1 p.m. when an hour was taken for lunch. At 2 p.m., blank again continued the general examination of the subject, with blank being used as before lunch as interpreter. This examination lasted until 3 p.m. when the blank concluded the first medical session and a portable polygraph was taken in by blank for the purpose of polygraph testing. There's a bunch of blanked out stuff. On Saturday, 22nd January 1955, subject had breakfast with blank at 9.35 a.m. Blank arrived at the safe house and at 9.45 a.m. Blank arrived at 10.35 a.m. The subject again with blank act acting as interpreter was examined briefly by the blank. At 10.50 a.m., the blank left the operations area and blank began polygraph testing. This examination lasted until 12.37, by when it was concluded. Then it goes on, I'll skip a little bit about... Uh, subject was taken into the special operations room with only the blank present, and at 2.36 p.m., the first intravenous uh, infusion began. Slow injections were continued until 2.46 p.m., when the blank signaled that the subject was fully affected by the chemicals, and at this time, special recording and transmitting equipment was brought into the operations room. Also at this time, Blank left the room and Blank entered. From this point until approximately 4.15 p.m., then the interrogations end, when the interrogations ended, artichoke techniques were applied. These techniques, which followed a previously agreed upon plan, were in three stages. A. This is now deliberate implantation of false memories. A fantasy which Blank results during this phase were good and sub the subject had no control. Time approximately 15 to 20 minutes. B, a fantasy in which blank. Results were again very good, time approximately 40 to 45 minutes. C, following development of the fantasies as noted above, the subject was more or less directly interrogated by blank and blank introduced in blank. Results only fair, although the subject had little control. Time approximately 15 minutes. Immediately following the conclusion of the artichoke treatments, a general conference was held with all hands present. It was agreed at this time that further artichoke treatments were unnecessary, that results were as conclusive that in view of the subject's importance, additional work with chemicals or with the H technique might possibly antagonize the subject and hence would be unwarranted and unwise. Following the conclusion of the general discussion, all technical apparatus was removed from the premise, premises and all participating personnel except blank left the area after the blank had checked the subject. On Sunday, 23 January, in between 12 noon and approximately 1.30 p.m., the blank returned to the safe house and again re-examined the physical and mental condition of the subject. At this time, the subject reported he had slept fairly well, but he had a persistent headache. The blank pointed out that the headache was a natural consequence of the, quotes, examination, quotes, and it would gradually disappear. In addition, the blank wrote a prescription to be picked up in another name, which was for future use of the subject as a general sedative. At 1.50 p.m. approximately, blank left the safe house and subject was turned over for handling to case officers of his participating division. Conclusions. In the opinion of the artichoke team, artichoke team, the operation was profitable and successful. In this case, the subject was aware that he had been given certain types of solutions, but as to what he had been given or amounts given, he had no knowledge. Checks were made by Blank, and later Blank apparently indicated that the subject, although not having specific amnesia for the artichoke treatment, nevertheless was completely confused and memory was vague and faulty. This vagueness and failure of memory was intensified by the Blank explanation that the subject had been dreaming, an opinion which it appears the subject shared, at least in part. So that's obviously uh, operational use of sophisticated mind control, amnesia-inducing, and false memory implanting techniques in the United States in the 1950s by the CIA. And as part of a broad program of mind control research, experimentation, and operational use, which included the creation of Manchurian candidates. So this is why I say that I conclude that uh, I conclude that it's an established fact that the CIA and the military have been creating Manchurian candidates for operational use sec since the Second World War, at least into the 1950s, and that it's uh, not plausible denial in my mind to claim that it all stopped in 1973. Okay, so how did this whole network get constructed, and how does it work, and how is it supported? Well, we're going to take several steps beyond Oliver Stone in terms of level of conspiracy theory, but that's not the point of the talk. The conspiracy theory is interesting to get into, but what I actually believe is that there isn't a conspiracy. I think that the intelligence community is itself a polyfragmented entity with DID, and that there is no single executive host function, and that there is no little room where everybody's got it all planned out and under control, that it works as sort of a neural network with no executive host function, and that 
these old boys talk to these old boys who know this, who don't know this, who know that. So it's this kind of network model, and that's what you see in the slide. And all these slides are going to look like this. So I'm going to walk you now through all of the interconnections in this network, as I said, all of which are documented, and tell you about some of the history and talk about some of the ethical problems that arise. So as a matter of general background now, this slide is called Funding Funds Fronts for CIA Mind Control Research. MK Ultra, you've already seen, was from 1953 to 1963. The major funding fronts for MK Ultra were the Human Ecology Foundation that uh, Carl Rogers was on, was on the board of, the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, and the Geschichter Fund. Charles Geschichter is one of the MK Ultra contractors himself. So what would happen is the CIA would have its budget. It would pop money over the Human Ecology Foundation. The Human Ecology Foundation would put out a call for grants, and people would then submit applications. So it looks like a normal funding foundation. And some people were, as I said, were unwitting and just thought they were applying for a grant. And other people knew perfectly well that it was a front. The technical term for these kind of fronts is a cutout. So Human Ecology, Josiah Macy Jr. and Geschichter were CIA cutouts. Now, this Geschichter Fund was interesting. One of the MK Ultra projects that they funded was uh, construction of an, the Gorman Annex uh, George Washington University Hospital in uh, Washington. And since they're, you have to remember that the military and the CIA are federal bureaucracies. So you anticipate the behavior of federal bureaucracies in general when you're looking into their history and operations. So what they did was, they through MK Ultra they funded to Geschichter, who then funded out to the contractor, money to build the Gorman Annex as an addition to the hospital. Since this was money coming from a, a private foundation, it generated matching funds from another sector of the federal government. So the CIA got to double its budget by sucking money out of unwitting uh, civilian areas of the federal purse. What was the Gorman Annex for? It was for um, mind control chemical experimentation on terminal cancer patients. Three uh, career officers, CIA biochemists, were employed at the Gorman Annex under full cover. This is not really completely above board and ethical behavior. Uh, so Carl Rogers is on the board of the Human Ecology Foundation, is himself an MK Ultra contractor, and his specific project, so I've got his MK Ultra grant application. I've got him on the board of the Human Ecology Foundation. I've got uh, the description of the project that was funded through MK Ultra, and I've got the publication flowing from the project that exactly matches the grant application. And in the published paper, he acknowledges funding by the Human Ecology Foundation. So it's a completely documented closed loop. Okay. Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, who is on the board of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, an interesting fellow named Daniel X. Friedman. Daniel X. Friedman was the editor of the Archives of General Psychiatry from 1970 until his death in 1993. The Archives of General Psychiatry uh, is the most referenced psychiatric journal in the world by far. In other words, if you do citation index searches of references of psychiatry papers in published psychiatry papers, that is, it's an indexing of the publications in all the psychiatry journals in the world. The number of references to articles published in the archives of general psychiatry is seven times, if I have the number right, the next psychiatry journal in the world. So this is the number one great big place to publish. It's very biomedical reductionist, and it's virtually impossible to get a dissociative paper published in there. So these people, like Daniel Friedman, who are in network, are incredibly influential, powerful, controlling people in terms of the history of psychiatry, what gets funded, what gets reviewed, what gets published, who gets appointments, etc., etc., etc. It's all part of a very tight power structure network. Okay, now MK Ultra connects us up to Alan Dulles, which connects us back to human ecology over to Harold Wolf and back to Alan Dulles. How does that work? Alan Dulles is, was the director of the CIA from 1953 to 1961. He's the longest uh, running tenure as DCI, Director of Central Intelligence. In uh, the Second World War, he was employed by the OSS, 
Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor of the CIA, which was run by a guy called Wild Bill Donovan. And he was stationed in Switzerland and was heavily involved in, obviously since the enemy was the Germans and the Allies were the Russians, in the war he was supposed to be working with the Russians against the Germans, which he did. However, when you read the history of the OSS in the Second World War, in the last years of the war, the Cold War was already being deliberately planned out and set up by the intelligence agencies. And it was already apparent to the intelligence agencies that things were going to flip. That Germany would become the Allies and the Russians would become the enemies. And there's an awful lot of jockeying about whether the Germans were going to surrender in North Italy before the Russians got to Yugoslavia. And so there's now negotiations with the Germans that if they agreed to surrender early before the Russians got there, then there would be such and such a payoff which would secure the area for the Allies so that it wouldn't be taken over by the Russians. There's all this jockeying going on, and all this intrigue and uh, communication between the OSS and some of Hitler's generals. The arch enemy spy master that Alan Dulles was fighting against was Reinhard Galen, who is head of German intelligence in the uh, Eastern Front, which means Russia. At the end of the Second World War, Alan Dulles recruited Reinhard Galen to become the head of that division of the CIA's operations against Russia. This is a totally established fact. Harold Wolf is a guy who is the head of the Human Ecology Foundation who is a neurologist at Cornell. When Alan Dulles's son received a head wound in the uh, Korean War, he was brought back to the United States and treated by Harold Wolf. So you start to get a feel of why I call this an old boys network. Okay, let's come down here. We're MK Ultra, and we're over at hallucinogens. So there's a lot of MK Ultra subprojects that had to do with funding LSD and other hallucinogen research. A uh, person who did hallucinogen research and published a lot of hallucinogen research was Daniel Friedman. Uh, hallucinogen research also connects us down to Loretta Bender. So Loretta Bender is a much revered uh, author of the Bender Gestalt. Now look at these three names, Loretta Bender, Paul Hawk, and Ewan Cameron. You'll see that each of these names, uh, wait a minute, we're missing, an, uh, imagine what it's like for my secretary trying to make these slides. They're all supposed to connect to the American Journal of Psychiatry obituaries. Ewan Cameron had his obituary in the American Journal of Psychiatry, Paul Hawk had his obituary in the American Journal of Psychiatry, and Loretta Bender had her obituary in the American Journal of Psychiatry. So these are revered people who are being honored posthumously by the flagship journal of the American Psychiatric Association. And it's actually Stella Chess who writes the obituary for uh, Loretta Bender. Very glowing, what a wonderful contributor to child psychiatry, what a pioneer. Well, she forgot to mention in the obituary that in a publication that I have in my Loretta Bender file that I got out of the medical school library, Loretta Bender describes giving 150 micrograms of LSD per day to children aged 7 to 11 years of age for days, weeks, months, and in some cases even years in a row. And this is discussed at a CIA-sponsored symposium on LSD. Uh, this would not get through an ethics committee. Good morning and welcome to the International Connection. It's 9.33 on a Sunday morning and this is the second week into a lengthy radio series about mind control in Canada. We heard last week part one of a lecture by Dr. Colin Ross this week we'll hear part two of that three-part lecture. Dr. Ross is a Canadian psychiatrist working with survivors of dissociative identity disorder. He has also researched and documented the CIA's history of mind control experimentation. Everything in this lecture he has proven through the CIA's own documents obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. Once again, here is Dr. Colin Ross on CKLN. Loretta Bender describes giving 150 micrograms of LSD per day to children aged 7 to 11 years of age for days, weeks, months, and in some cases even years in a row. And this is discussed at a CIA-sponsored symposium on LSD. Uh, this would not get through an ethics committee. Paul Hawk. Anybody ever heard of a disorder called borderline personality disorder? Hawk and Politan, 1949, Psychiatric Quarterly neurotic forms of schizophrenia. These people are on the borderline between psychosis and uh, neurosis and schizophrenia. We call it pseudoneurotic schizophrenia. 
because they're on the borderline. It's one of the reasons why the word borderline caught on. Well, he did a hallucinogen research at, uh, in New York for the military and had one unfortunate complication and side effect. He killed Harold Blower, a tennis pro, in 1953 with an injection of army mescaline. And the family was eventually compensated for that. And he's a big time connected into all of the uh, hallucinogen research by the military and the CIA and is at many different CIA-sponsored conferences. Ewan Cameron, former uh, head of the Quebec Psychiatric Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the World Psychiatric Association, in fact, the founder of the World Psychiatric Association, and also one time president of the Society for Biological Psychiatry. As politically connected a guy as ever existed in the entire field of psychiatry in the 20th century, with his obituary in the American Journal of Psychiatry, funded through MKUltra and the Human Ecology Foundation, did LSD and other hallucinogen research funded by uh, Canadian military and the CIA, and um, was successfully sued. And he had already died. The CIA was settled out of court, actually. It wasn't a successful suit, technically, with uh, eight of his patients who had been victims of experimentation that was first funded directly by the CIA through the human ecology and then by the Canadian government. Uh, when one of his subjects is called, uh, one of his papers published in the American Journal of Psychiatry is on psychic driving. Another is on production of differential amnesia in schizophrenia. I interviewed a woman named Linda McDonald who's identified in public. This is not a uh, problem with violation of her confidentiality and I have released from her to talk about her and write about her. She uh, was 25 years old when she went to McGill to be treated for a relatively mild postpartum depression. She turned 26 during her hospitalization from March, which was from sometime in March to early September 1963. During the course of her hospitalization she received 102 ECT treatments using the Page Russell technique in which the button is pushed six times for treatment instead of one. She also received uh, about 80 days of barbiturate and neuroleptic induced sleep. During the course of the hospitalization, now I don't have just her testimony, I have the actual medical record with all of the nursing notes documenting this and Ewan Cameron's signature in the chart. So this is not rumor or patient distortion, this is the actual medical record and this is work that's been settled out of court by the CIA. Um, she comes in as a normal, somewhat depressed person who, on my interview, I would say she probably had DDNOS before she was admitted. She gets regressed back to incontinent of urine, incontinent of feces, totally disoriented, unable to state her own name, the year, where she is, recognize her children, recognize her husband. She gradually comes out of this at the time of discharge she sent home to live with her husband and children, resume normal sexual relations with her husband. She doesn't know how to drive a car, read, cook, use a toilet. Not only does she not know exactly what sex is all about, and she's not exactly sure who her husband is, she doesn't know what the concept of a husband is. So she neuropsychologically pulls out of this over months, and several months down the road, she's at the point where the full-time homemaker has taught her how to scramble eggs. She was a fully competent housewife and mother before this. When her children go out to play on the street, she's unable to remember 30 seconds later where they are. So she puts a map of the neighborhood up on the wall and puts pins in the map to keep track of where her kids are playing. Otherwise, she goes into a panic and doesn't know what's going on. By about a year, she appears to have made a full neuropsychological recovery and when I interview her several years ago in Vancouver, she appears to be neuropsychologically intact and to be suffering from no active psychiatric disorder. The problem is that she can't remember anything from the time she left the hospital back to birth. So this is uh, CIA and uh, Canadian military funded research to totally wipe out somebody's memory, which is very successful. In the published articles on psychic driving and creation of differential amnesia and schizophrenia, the claim is that if you have somebody who's been delusional for the last five years and you give them this, quote, regressive ECT, 
regress them down to total infantile incompetence and bring them back up. And while you do that, you play a lot of tape loops, so they listen to these looped statements over and over and over and over and over, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a day, that they will come back to their normal waking state and they will have specific amnesia for the time during which they've been delusional and for the delusional material, and their schizophrenia will then be cured. So this is very careful, deliberate research to produce specific amnesias and total global amnesia. So we would certainly want to honor that man in the American Journal of Psychiatry. So this is how the funding was set up. Okay, let's look at the network for both the creation of Manchurian candidates and the denial of the existence of Manchurian candidates. How is that structured? Because you would think it might be logical to have a disinformation program in place. It's a little... I think we can, Nancy, are you going to be the adjuster on the focus again there? A little drift on the focus there. It's always hard to tell from the front. Okay. Now, like any complex system, it's sort of arbitrary where you enter the system. But let's enter at MK Ultra, which we saw is connected to Bluebird and Artichoke. Both of those are connected to the CIA. The CIA is highly connected to military intelligence, structurally, committee cross-references, and cooperation in many of these documented mind control research projects. Okay, so in the uh, Senate committee hearings in the 1970s about MKUltra, John Gittinger, who was the head PhD psychologist in uh, MKUltra, testified that the creation of Manchurian candidates and the movie The Manchurian Candidate, which he referred to in his testimony, were just fiction. That's ridiculous and that had never been done. But we see that MKUltra, on which he was the lead psychologist, was actually an administrative rollover from Bluebird and Artichoke, and we've just read material in which they explicitly are describing clear creation of Manchurian candidates, so it's not possible that he didn't know that. So the, the options here are either he was so out of it that he didn't realize that that was Manchurian candidates that were being created there, or he was somehow administratively out of the loop and never even looked at the Bluebird and Artichoke documents, which is fairly unbelievable, or it's deliberate disinformation. Well, let's go from the CIA up here to military intelligence over to Estabrooks. Okay, we've got Estabrooks actually creating Manchurian candidates. So that's Manchurian candidate creation, which goes back to Bluebird and Artichoke. So we've got that loop already discussed. Let's hop from CIA to Martin Orne. Well, we saw in the original list of MKUltra consultants that Martin Orne was funded through that and had top secret clearance. When you look at Martin Orne's CV, he lists in his CV numerous military intelligence funding sources, virtually all branches of the military, and he, in his publications, uh, cites funding by uh, Air Force, Army, Army, I'm pretty sure, Office of Naval Research, etc., and Human Ecology. Uh, he also, um, a uh, reliable source informed me that he also uh, consulted the National Security Agency. So he basically consulted with all branches of the military, uh, intelligence and civilian intelligence network. He also has taken the position since at least 1984 in public that multiple personality disorder is almost all the time a iatrogenic artifact. And he's debated this vociferously at the APA annual meetings from 1988 on, and has published a lot of discussion and commentary on this in the International Journal of Clinical Experimental Hypnosis. So his basic position is that MPD is created by the therapist. Now, why would he think this and believe this, given that he's totally connected into military intelligence? He's one of the leading experts in hypnosis. He's a friend of, correspondent of, He's edited by, and he references G. H. Estabrooks, who is also one of the leading hypnosis experts at the same time, and also is tightly tied into military intelligence. And Estabrooks knows those other people like Milton Erickson and Hilgard, who are all totally interconnected by their common work and references. Well, Martin Orne might believe that all these civilian DID cases are actually iatrogenic DID because 
that's the universe he's grown up in. He can't step outside his own knowledge of the creation of mentor and candidates by the military to conceive of the idea that it might arise naturalistically. So it's basically projection or lack of intellect. It's unlikely to be lack of intellect because Martin Orne does not lack intellect. The fact that he was too dumb to get it is totally implausible because he's a very bright guy. So that explanation we can rule out. And the other explanation is deliberate disinformation. There's no way to discriminate between those hypotheses or test them with the available data. Okay, so Martin Orne says that DID is iatrogenic. Oh, what's this thing over here? FMSF, False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Well, isn't this funny? Martin Orne is on the Scientific Advisory Board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, and the False Memory Syndrome Foundation clearly promotes the idea that DID is either almost entirely or 100% entirely an iatrogenic artifact. Where does that take us down to? Oh, that takes us to Manchurian candidate denial. Okay. That's done specifically by Richard Offshe, who is a scientific advisory board member of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, in his book, Making Monsters, where he ridicules me as a CIA conspiracy nut who believes that the CIA has been creating multiple personality disorder, which in fact is a documented fact. Uh, here we are. Let's skip back to here. We're at the CIA and we're at MK Ultra. We're missing another connection here. We should go MK Ultra to Jolly West, but CIA connects to Jolly West because he was funded under MK Ultra to study the psychobiology of dissociation. Uh, he's will probably go down in history for being the only person to kill an elephant at Oklahoma City Zoo with LSD. <laughs> well, Jolly West is going to show up on a bunch of subsequent slides. So what we're looking at is two-dimensional slices of a three or n-dimensional space. So you're going to see Jolly West connects out to here and off the screen and up and down and around the back of the screen and so on. One place that he connects is here to here. Now, where did he start off in his professional career? He started off as a top secret cleared guy for the Air Force who interviewed the American pilots who came back from North Korea having been captured and brainwashed by the communist Chinese. These were people who were real good Americans who were flying jets, who got shot down by the communist enemy, who went to prison as POWs and came back as communists. Have we ever heard of anything like this before in our lives? This is the creation of a new identity and suppression of the old identity and all its allegiances through mind control coercive persuasion techniques. These American pilots were Manchurian candidates of a sort without full amnesia for their previous identity. So they were kind of a DDNOS level Manchurian candidate as opposed to a full DID level Manchurian candidate. And he was one of the guys who interrogated them, understood them, wrote about them, and wrote about how to arm future military personnel against such interrogation. Uh, Robert Lifton also had top secret clearance from the Air Force to interview uh, these down American pilots. And there's several other people in the group there, including Margaret Singer, who wrote the book Cults in Our Midst, which I talked about as the foundation for the iatrogenic pathway to DID. She had top secret clearance to interview these pilots as well. Margaret Singer publishes with Jolly West, and Margaret Singer publishes with Richard Offshe, who is an expert on course of mind control and cult persuasion techniques. So that's real funny. Okay, let's go to military intelligence over to False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Who's that guy? Oh, what's that say there? Oh, it says Paul McHugh. Who's Paul McHugh? He's the guy who says that, who's chairman of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins, who says that 100% of cases of DID are iatrogenic and says that all the dissociative disorders units should be shut down. And he's on the advisory board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. He connects the DID as iatrogenic. He connects to Johns Hopkins because He's the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry there. He connects over to Walter Reed Hospital because uh, when he was in the military, he did research at Walter Reed Hospital that's listed in his CV, which is a major site for military intelligence work and is directly connected into the mind control network. Now, why do I have Johns Hopkins connected to MKUltra? Because a prior chairman of the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins named James Whitehorn 
was on the advisory board of the Human Ecology Foundation. They had uh, top secret clearance and was witting that the Human Ecology Foundation was actually a funding fund for MK Ultra. So one of his immediate predecessors was directly in that work with top secret clearance. So again, we have, now the research in his CV, I haven't actually gotten the papers out and read it, that he did in the military doesn't look like mind control research. But then the whole question becomes, what are the hypotheses to account for his behavior? Here we have apparently a relatively bright guy who's head of department in one of the leading medical schools in the world who just doesn't get it. He thinks that all DID is iatrogenic. Is this because he's not smart enough? Doesn't seem to be a plausible explanation. Well, is it because of some sort of peculiarity of his personal experience in his psychology that we don't know about? Maybe. Maybe it's disinformation. No way to know, no way to prove it one way or another. But this is the network for the creation and the denial of Manchurian candidates. It's a very funny little network. Okay, let's take a look, since we're all into False Memory Syndrome Foundation here, let's take a, take a look at the relations between the Cult Awareness Network and the False Syndrome Foundation, False Memory Syndrome Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. And this is going to start taking us out beyond Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone will say, oh, "Now this is too much. I'm not making a movie about this." <laughs> There's still hope that we could land at the X Files, though. <laughs> okay, so CAN means the Cult Awareness Network, CIA means the Central Intelligence Agency, and FMS means the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Uh, Jolly West is on the board of CAN and the False Memory Syndrome Foundation is connected to the CIA. Margaret Singer is connected to Jolly West and Richard Offshee. Margaret Singer and Jolly West are on the board of CAN and Richard Offshee is on the board of FMSF. Jolly West and Margaret Singer worked for Air Force Intelligence uh, talking to those Korean downed pilots who were actually DDNOS level Manchurian candidates. Uh, Leo Ryan, we're going to hear a bunch about Jonestown in a minute. Leo Ryan is the congressman who was killed at the airport in Johnstown at the same time as the mass suicide there, which was not actually a suicide. His daughter, Patricia Ryan, is very active in the Cult Awareness Network and recently received the Leo Ryan Award. So Leo Ryan connects to Jonestown. Jonestown connects up to the CIA through that loop because the CAN is interested in destructive cults and course of persuasion. And I'm going to show you in subsequent slides the connections between Jonestown and the CIA. Jonestown connects down to, obviously, expertise in cult course of persuasion techniques. Jim Jones was a big expert. That takes us back up to Jolly West, Margaret Singer, Richard Offshee, Air Force Intelligence, the CIA. So all this thing all interconnects here. So who's this guy, Robert Heath? Well, we're going to see him in a future slide, too. My secretary's actually interviewed him, and I might go down and interview him in person myself at Tulane in New Orleans. He did brain electrode implant research for the CIA uh, and so he would put brain electrodes in human brains for non-therapeutic purposes, and then he would pour in psilocybin, mescaline, LSD, and other chemicals to see what would go tingle-tingle in the electrodes. And I'll tell you more about that. So he's funded by the CIA and the military. In one of his papers, one of his subjects, he thanks Harold Leaf for referring in one of his brain electrode implant research subjects. Harold Leaf is on the advisory board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation and, in fact, was personal psychiatrist to the Fried family. And all, so all these guys know each other. I'm just giving you kind of a sketch of how this thing is constructed. Okay, so let's now take the step beyond Oliver Stone. This is the connections between Jonestown and the CIA. This is based on uh, references that are in, I think, it's the next slide, if I remember right. Okay, the center here is we're talking about the CIA with its interest in mind control. Now, according to this book, which is entitled Was Jonestown a CIA Medical Experiment by Michael Myers, and according to him, Jonestown was a CIA medical experiment. It was a mind control research site. So that seems preposterous and impossible to believe. What data and circumstantial evidence add up to that conclusion? Well, we know that uh, Leo Ryan was connected to the CIA. How do we know that? Well, let's take a look over here in our package. We'll go back a few pages back from uh, Hypnosis Comes of Age article. 
And here we have a letter from the Deputy Director of the Central Intelligence Ag Agency dated 18th of October, 1978. Honorable Leo Ryan, House of Representatives, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Ryan, thank you for your letter of 27th September to Admiral Turner requesting confirmation or denial of the fact of CIA experiments using prisoners at the California Medical Facility at Vacaville. MK Search Site Principal Investigator James Hamilton. It is true that CIA sponsored that's coming from me for somebody listening for, to the tape, not from the letter. It is true that CIA sponsored testing using volunteer inmates was conducted at that facility. The project was completed in 1968. A report setting forth the details of that testing has been released to the authorities at Vacaville and to the public. It is enclosed for your information and review. Da 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 da. Your letter, uh, oh, uh, the research it says at the end of the paragraph was uh, related to learning enhancement using a well-known non-hallucinogen magnesium pemeline, or pemeline, which is Silert, which is used for ADD. Your letter referred to Donald DeFries, known as Sank, and Clifford Jefferson, both of whom were inmates at Vacaville. Insofar as our reports reflect the names of the participants, there is nothing to indicate that either was in any way involved in the project. You may wish to contact the authorities at Vacaville for further information. So Leo Ryan was corresponding directly with the CIA about some of its mind control research. He was also the father of uh, pending legislation by which all CIA covert operations would be subject to direct congressional oversight from a budgetary point of view. Uh, I haven't got Charles Manson connected in. Uh, you got to go a long way out there to get all these connections. Is Charles Manson in Vacaville? Oh, I didn't know that's where he was. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a bunch about Vacaville, so it's not surprising that he's at Vacaville. So Leo Ryan is really pestering the CIA to get all their covert operations under uh, direct funding oversight and budgetary control of Congress. He is bugging the CIA about their mind control research. He's found out that Donald DeFries was at Vacaville at the same time as it was a research site. We've seen in other documentation that that's MK Search and the investigator is James Hamilton, who had top secret clearance. Also, uh, Leo Ryan was involved in Jonestown because he was killed at the airport. Well, that's very funny. How does Leo Ryan connect down to Patty Hearst? Patty Hearst was captured by the Symbionese Liberation Army, which was headed by Donald DeFries, whose code name was Sank. She was found guilty. She was actually a Manchurian candidate, a DDNOS level Manchurian candidate who is uh, captured, if you remember, don't remember the story, she's the son of William Randolph Hearst, who ran the San Francisco Chronicle, that was running a whole lot of very critical articles about the People's Temple, Jim Jones's cult, while it was still in Ukiah. His daughter, Patty Hearst, was a college student who was captured by the Symbionese Liberation Army at gunpoint with submachine guns, kept locked in a closet for 42 days, and subjected to very systematic course of persuasion, brainwashing, and mind control techniques until she adopted a new identity named Tanya and lost all of her emotional connectedness to her prior life and her parents. Participated in the robbery of a bank and was found guilty. The Free Patty Hearst movement was uh, headed by Leo Ryan, who was very active in getting clemency for her from the president. Okay, what's so Patty Hearst? How does she connect to Donald DeFries? Well, he captured her. How does Donald DeFries connect to Vacaville? Well, he was at Vacaville as a prisoner. What is Vacaville? Well, let's hop over here to Jolly West. That'll help us to figure out. Oh, yeah, Jolly West. Well, he was the expert witness in the trial for Patty Hearst. Who were the expert witnesses called to explain to the uh, jury that Patty Hearst was, in fact, the victim of course of persuasion, mind control, and brainwashing? Uh, Patty Hearst, Margaret Singer... Uh, I mean, Patty Hearst was the defendant, Jolly West, Margaret Singer, Robert Lifton, and Martin Orn. So what did Jolly West have to do with Vacaville? Well, Jolly West was head of the UCLA Violence Project, which was approved by Ronald Reagan when he was governor of California, and then shut down by public protest. It was spearheaded by a number of people, um, including some people very interested in CIA military mind control history have written books about it. Well, the UCLA Violence Project, you're going to see in subsequent slides, but it included uh, research and experimentation that was going to be done at Vacaville Prison, where they had the Maxi Maxi, 
which is the maximum security place for the most freaked out, behaviorally disturbed, psychotic, psychologically difficult inmates in the California prison system, which included Donald DeFreeze and Charles Manson, we hear. Well, okay, Donald DeFreeze, who's, who's Colston Westbrook? Okay, according to a book on the Phoenix program, which was the CIA's covert operation in the Vietnam War, for uh, killing 20 VC infrastructure non-military personnel headed by William Colby, future director of the Central Intelligence Agency. According to that book, Colston Westbrook was a CIA psi war expert in Vietnam who came back to the United States to Vacaville prison under cover of the Black Cultural Association and used behavior modification techniques on Donald DeFreeze and gave him his code name Sank and devised the seven-headed logo of the Symbionese Liberation Army. Subsequent to this course of persuasion work done on Donald DeFries by this Psy War expert employed by the CIA in Vietnam, Donald DeFries was transferred to another location in the jail from which he very easily escaped the next day, only to go capture Patty Hearst and use very systematic and sophisticated mind control techniques on her, despite the fact that he was a functionally illiterate black person off the streets. And then two paperbacks, which are published by Avon Books, both of which are owned by the Hearst Corporation. Douglas Valentine, 1990, The Phoenix Program, New York Avon Books, and the specific reference is page 337. Patty Hearst, 1982, the title of the book is Patty Hearst, Her Own Story, New York Avon Books, pages 133 and 134. Now the person who was going to ask a question as soon as we started, oh here she's coming in, I think. No, so we're going to get into Jonestown now, but did you have a question that you wanted to ask just before the break? Uh, oh, Mark Lane. Oh, Mark Lane, yeah. Um, I think I don't know too much about that. I mean, the political connections are myriad and tend to be... Right. The actors are either the far left or the far right. I agree with that. Okay, this is uh, from this book was Jonestown, a CIA medical experiment. This is some general background now. Okay, this, there's this guy, James Frank, who won the 1925 Nobel Prize in Physics, who came over to be part of the Manhattan Project, which created the atomic bomb. And that's, gonna, that's a sort of precursor of the paperclip project, which we'll get to in future slides. He recruited Lawrence Layton into the Manhattan Project. So that's the connection between these people. Now we're going to go to this Leighton family. This Hugo Philip and Anita Lee Halbert uh, married in Germany in 1914, and they uh, moved to the United States. They had these two daughters, uh, Eva and uh, Lisa. They're, and these are their. Uh, this is Lisa's birth date here. Lisa is this person. Lisa, Eva doesn't really figure into the story. Lisa worked for the CIA at Berkeley. The author of this book was Jonestown, a CIA medical experiment, got all this information from the public record by just piecing it together, bit by bit by bit by bit. And the documentation in the references is pretty solid and convincing. So she worked for the CIA at Berkeley, uh, and her job at the library, her job was to keep track of all the left-wing literature uh, taken out of the library and the names of the people who took it, those books out and report that to the CIA. Uh, Berkeley's got a lot of really top-notch people at it, such as Richard Offshee. Lisa, Layton Mar Lisa married uh, Lawrence Layton, who is recruited to the Manhattan Project by James Frank. He later worked at Dugway Proving Ground where uh, radiation experiments were done, including release of radioactivity uh, for wind dispersal over civilian populations. He was an expert in dispersal of biological and chemical weapons. And that Dugway Proving Ground was also one of the sites where Army LSD research was conducted. So this couple had four children. Uh, Deborah, who murdered, married Phil Blakey, murdered, she, she almost murdered him. Lawrence Jr. Annalisa and Thomas, and these two are not so involved in the picture. Uh, Lawrence Jr. was on site at the People's Temple. Uh, Lisa was on site at the People's Temple in Jonestown in British Guiana, 
and Deborah was on site there, and she was the chief financial officer for the People's Temple operation. She left Jonestown shortly before the mass suicide and went back to the uh, uh, Georgetown, the capital of British Guiana, accompanied by the uh, CIA chief of station for Georgetown. Uh, Phil Blakey was an interesting guy with a international arms sales and British intelligence background, if I remember right. Now here this gets, this is where it really starts to get convincing and amazing. So we've all heard about Jonestown. We all know that Jim Jones had this group of people and he was in Ukiah, California. And then all of a sudden he moved to the middle of the jungle in British Guiana. And I assume we all had the same experience I had. We just sort of take that at face value. Here's this nut. He moves down to the middle of the jungle in British Guiana, but like, how did he ever choose that location? Who scouted it out? Like, what about the logistics of getting all the lumber, all the oil drums, all the everything down to the middle of the jungle in British Guiana? You got to build an airport. You got to trans. This is a huge, huge project. Well, it turns out that this wasn't just jungle before the People's Temple arrived. It was the Shalom Project from 1973 to 1975, and Phil Blakey oversaw the engineering development of the site in its transition from the Shalom Project to the People's Temple. What was the Shalom Project? It was a CIA operation for training black mercenary guerrillas for operations in Angola. This was a CIA training site. This was not a random, unconnected site. That's just some general background. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna pick up Jonestown kind of as we bop along here through these crystal clear slides. Okay, we've heard part of this story. We've got here's J. Edgar Hoover. He's corresponding with Esther Brooks, who's creating Manchurian candidates. Patty Hearst is a Manchurian candidate. Her identity of Tanya is deliberately programmed in by Donald DeFries, who's from Vacaville State Prison, which was an MK search site, which is also a site for the UCLA Violence Project. Vacaville's a CIA research site. Uh, Patty Hearst is connected down to Jolly West, who's her expert witness in her trial, who says, in effect, she's a Manchurian candidate, DDNOS level. Uh, he's the expert witness for Jack Ruby. Let's come back. Oh, Jack Ruby, some of you may recall, is connected to Lee Harvey Oswald. In, uh, I went to the, uh, one of the JFK assassination uh, meetings in Dallas a couple of years ago where a guy presented a bunch of information, including a photocopy of a letter by J. Edgar Hoover dated 1960, expressing concern that Lee Harvey Oswald had been doubled. Uh, J and the FBI was on top of Lee Harvey Oswald, knew who he was and was tracking him uh, systematically well before the assassination. So that, that connects J. Edgar Hoover to Lee Harvey Oswald, which connects over to Jack Ruby. Okay, how does Wounded Knee get in there? Wounded Knee is the Indian uprising where the FBI were shooting up the Sioux Indians. Russell Means was heavily involved in that. What does Russell Means have to do with Jonestown? Well, Jim Jones uh, was a good PR guy. When Patty Hearst was kidnapped, he, he offered William Randolph Hearst uh, a program to set up uh, a collection of money, a donation of money, to pay the ransom for the SLA, the Symbionese Liberation Army. And the SLA was demanding this huge, multi, like something like $170 million from William Randolph Hearst for the release of Patty Hearst. Jim Jones offered to set up this fund, but William Randolph first said no. The net outcome was that the SLA also wanted food donated to the poor people that they thought they were representing in the revolution. So a committee was set up to do food distribution financed by William Randolph first. According to this book, the way that food distribution was done was Jim Jones got control of the mechanism and he brought people from the People's Temple down to be the homeless and poor people who received the food and the same food was redistributed around the network six times, constantly being picked up by new People's Temple people taken back to the distribution point. So actually only one-sixth as much food was purchased as it appeared, and the rest was skimmed by the People's Temple. Russell Means was on the committee that oversaw this operation, and Russell Means's wife 
was bailed out of jail in Oregon the year before uh, at a cost of $19,000 by Jim Jones. Who was working for Disney? Russell Means works for Walt Disney, and that's nice to know. <laughs> so this arrow actually goes over here to Mickey Mouse. <laughs> okay, so we're, we did Vacaville State Prison, MK Search, that's all connected into uh, Patty Hearst, Donald DeFries. We've got that part. We've got MK Ultra connected to UCLA. What's that MK Ultra got to do with that Sugi U2 base? That's the U2 spy plane. Well, that's uh, according to uh, information from JFK assassination researchers that I haven't independently confirmed. That was one of the MK Ultra sites. Lee Harvey also was stationed there. Uh, U2 was the plane that Gary Powers went down in. It was a spy plane that oversaw, uh, that overflew the Soviet Union. It was also used uh, for surveillance of Martin Luther King. That's a acknowledged fact. The FBI used U2 airplanes to keep track of him. According to um, a book which is a little shaky in terms of its documentation, the people who were consulted on the mental state of Gary Powers, the pilot of the U-2 that was down, included Ewan Cameron, who is an MK Ultra contractor, uh, who did the experimentation on Linda McDonald that I told you about earlier. Ewan Cameron was also one of the people who went over and interviewed the Nazi war criminals at Nuremberg to do mental status exams on them. So the FBI's in there fairly tight. Let's just talk about MK Ultra, MK Search assassination connection. So this is now out beyond Oliver Stone. And we're going to pick up uh, JFK, a little bit of Jonestown, a little bit of this and that here. So we've got MK Search, Carl Pfeiffer, was a contractor for MK Search and MK Ultra. One of the sites that he worked at is the New Jersey Reformatory at Bordentown, which was in some of those preliminary MK Ultra lists that I showed. Now, in Walter Board's book, um, Mind Control, uh, Operation Mind Control, he talks about Louis Castillo. Louis Castillo was arrested by the FBI the Philippines equivalent of the FBI on suspicion of being there to assassinate Marcos. In uh, uh, 300 pages of transcripts of the interrogation of Louis Castillo by the Philippines FBI that's in the possession of the JSK assassination researcher who told me where G. H. Brooks' personal papers are, Louis Castillo uh, describes very clearly, and this is also described in Walter Bohr's book, having multiple personality disorder. So here's a potential assassin of Marcos who describes undocumented multiple personality disorder who was at the New Jersey Reformatory at Bordentown at the same time as it was an MK search hallucinogen site and an MK ultra hallucinogen site. Here we've got Lee Harvey Oswald, who's at, at Sugi Air Force Base, which is apparently an MK Ultra research site, who's connected over to Jack Ruby, who's connected to Jolly West, who's an MK Ultra contractor, who's the expert witness for Patty Hearst, who's uh, Manchurian candidate identity Tanya is created by Donald DeFries from Vacaville State Prison, which is an MK search site, which takes us back to the New Jersey Reformatory at Bordentown. This is all just random coincidence, as I'm sure you appreciate. Okay, how about JFK CIA mind control research connections? I, I might come back to Jonestown in more detail. I'm just trying to get through all these slides here. Cool, this is a very pretty little diagram with CIA at the hub, and then we've basically got a wheel going all the way around. There's a game that I saw in the newspaper called, uh, I don't know the exact name of it, but it's basically who was in a movie with Kevin Bacon. And it tur the purpose of the game is and you can name any Hollywood star, and within six steps, you can get for that person to Kevin Bacon. Because this person was in a movie with this person who was in a movie with this person who was in a movie with Kevin Bacon. So this is the same logic here. We, we can start anywhere. We can connect Jolly West to the CIA. Neil Birch is a CIA uh, Air Force Military Office of Naval Research uh, Mind Control Consultant in Houston. Uh, Robert Heath is a CIA and military 
uh, funded brain electrode researcher at Tulane. Well, let's just go through this random assortment of individuals here. Okay, Robert Heath is doing brain electrode implant and other research for the CIA in Tulane. He publishes a paper with Bernie Salzberg. Bernie Salzberg publishes with Neil Birch, who is funded by the CIA and the military. Neil Birch publishes an edited book. Contributor of a chapter to that book is Jolly West, who describes the UCLA violence project in the book edited by Neil West. Jolly West interviews Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby shoots Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay, well, that's interesting. That's the end of the story. Except, let's run back around this way. Robert Heath, publishes with Francisco Silva, who's still alive, who I'm going to try and interview in uh, Baton Rouge. Francisco Silva is a Cuban psychiatrist who left in the random year of 1959, which is when Castro took over, to uh, take up residence in Louisiana and work and publish with Robert Heath, who told my secretary that Francisco Silva is a very wonderful person. In the Warren Commission documents, there's uncorroborated testimony by Lee Harvey Oswald that in 1963, prior to the assassination, he lived with Francisco Silva and was uh, temporarily employed at the hospital where Francisco Silva worked. Sometimes I'm just sort of playing mind games with you. This is all just meaningless coincidence. Okay. Project Paperclip and Mind Control Research. Okay, CIA, we he heard about Alan Dulles already. He is the director of the Central Intelligence Agency before George Bush was the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, which in turn was before George Bush was the president. Alan Dulles is uh, head of the CIA during the MKUltra program and was obviously was aware of it and oversaw it. The CIA uh, goes to Alan Dulles, which goes back to this Reinhard Galen guy, who is the German spy master that was recruited by Dulles to become our boy spying against the Russians, our enemies who were previously were our friends. Reinhard Galen is, a, in effect, a Nazi war criminal. Comes down to here. Project Paperclip is a fully documented project that's one of a group of projects, including uh, Project, Na I think, National Interest, Project 63. There's a, uh, something with the word blood in it, Bloodstone. There's a bunch of other projects, but Paperclip is the best known one. There's several books about it. Project Paperclip is a program set up by the CIA and military intelligence uh, to bring Nazi war criminals into the United States through a mechanism that rooted them around the State Department. State Department rules were that if you're a Nazi war criminal, you couldn't emigrate to the United States. But there was a mad scramble at the uh, end of the Second World War involving the um, U.S., uh, Canada, British, French, German uh, and Russian governments who were all scrambling to get their hands on German scientists. And there was all kinds of like recruiting drives and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, American teams would actually go into uh, like the Russian sector and go into a, a place where German scientists were being held and sneak those guys out of there. So it, it was quite, uh, quite an intense little party that was going on. In Project Paperclip, all, this is totally documented, all types of scientists were brought over to the United States. Film experts, ball bearing experts, lubricants, rockets, every aspect of science and technology of interest to the military. It included some somewhat obscure people like Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was uh, head of the rocket program. He uh, was the guy who was in charge of the V-2 rockets that were used to bomb Britain, which were created at the Middle Verk. The labor for the Middle Verk was supplied from Camp Dora. When the American troops uh, liberated Camp Dora, they found 6,000 corpses on the ground. It's estimated that about 20,000 people were worked to death out of Camp Dora building the V-2 rockets. Uh, Werner von Braun is documented as being on site at the Middle Verk at least 20 times and being at meetings of uh, V2 oversight personnel where the use of uh, prisoners being worked to death was discussed and condoned. And the uh, workers would sometimes attempt to sabotage the rockets by urinating on the parts or tampering with the rockets. The typical response to that was that the entire work crew would be instantly hung in their work tunnel. He was also a member of the SS 
and there's a correspondence on uh, U.S. space program stationery to a journalist in which Werner von Braun admits that he was an uh, SS officer. So he was a Nazi war criminal who couldn't be brought in through a normal kind of visa process. Another person who was brought in through Paperclip or another related project was Albertus Strughold. Albertus Strughold is regarded as the father of aviation medicine. There's a library named after him at uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Uh, he was honored by the Daughters of the American Revolution for his contribution to aviation medicine, and the Texas State Legislature declared uh, a one-time state Memorial Day named after him in, I believe it was the 1960s. Albertus Strughold was not a nice person. People on his own administrative level, people who reported to him, and people that he reported to were all uh, tried and found guilty at Nuremberg of war crimes. He was not even interviewed by the U.S. lawyers responsible for that sector of Nuremberg. The types of experiments that these people did included things like uh, putting people in a pressure chamber and dropping the pressure instantly to about 60,000 feet to simulate somebody being blown out of a cockpit if they were a U.S. pilot. What would happen then is they would uh, claw at their faces, experience excruciating pain, uh, and die, uh, either uh, actually die or almost die. The ones who died uh, would be taken out of the chamber, their heads would be cut open, then their heads would be submerged underwater, their brains would then be sliced open, to determine whether there was air emboli in their cerebral arteries. Another type of experiment done by these people was to attempt to find an antidote to seawater so that downed German pilots in the North Sea could drink seawater. So these people were given uh, forced feedings of seawater for days on end, which then would be doctored with various different substances to see whether any of the substances would prevent the subjects from dying. This is major full tilt Nazi doctor war crime stuff and probably over a thousand of these uh, kind of scientists were brought in over under Project Paperclip. The uh, Nazi war criminals were examined by a team of psychiatrists, including Ewan Cameron, who did LSD and mescaline research, who was an MK Ultra contractor. LSD and mescaline research was also funded by uh, MK Ultra, and mescaline research was done by the Nazi war criminals in the uh, prisoner of war camps. So you and Cameron probably got the bright idea of LSD and mescaline research from the Nazi war criminals. And according to this book, which is not real rock solid in its documentation, he was still in network up in the early 1960s when uh, the U-2 pilot went down. So the only people who are missing from this fully, completely documented history are the psychological warfare experts. It is not possible that the only kind of scientists out of the full range of military expertise that were not brought over was the psychological warfare experts. And uh, um, a guy who was a um, uh, deep ops character in Vietnam described being out in the field and coming across uh, US and VC personnel who were all totally wasted on some sort of hallucinogen trip. And their job would simply be to extract these guys and leave the VC, who are just completely out of it, on the ground. Uh, he, he told me which, uh, which specific uh, location in the United States would be the most likely place to find some of these uh, paperclip psychological warfare experts, so I'm going to pursue that. Let's just take a look at the brain electrode implant research. Now, let's say it's just not believable that the CIA and the military have been creating mentoring candidates. It's too much. It's science fiction. Well, what do we know for a fact that they've been doing? We know that they've been giving kids, uh, if you do milligrams per kilogram or micrograms per kilogram, big time street doses of LSD, days, weeks, and months, and a year, up to years in a row. We know that they've been implanting non-therapeutic brain electrodes in children as young as 11 years old on an experimental basis. And we know that they've been wiping out people's entire personal histories with 102 ECT treatments and massive sleep induction through drugs for no therapeutic reason whatsoever. But we don't think they would go as far as creating a maturing candidate. So it doesn't add up. What we know for an absolute documented fact is that they've gone way beyond 
monkeying around with some amnesia barriers and new identities. So what's the story on brain electrode implant research? Oh, here's a name you might recognize. Well, brain electrode implant research was funded by the CIA and MKUltra in conjunction with the Office of Naval Research. There's a lot of joint funding of various projects by Office of Naval Research and the CIA. The Office of Naval Re Research funded both Neil Birch and the CIA. And Neil Birch published that thing by Jolly West. Jolly West started the UCLA Violence Project, which was going to be at Vacaville, which is where Donald DeFries was. He recruited a brain electrode implant psychiatrist who was part of a brain electrode implant team at Harvard, Frank Irvin, to be part of the UCLA Violence Project. He denies in his chapter in the book by Neil Birch that there was any intention to do brain electrode implants, but the available evidence suggests that actually, in fact, the plan was to stick brain electrodes in some of these prisoners at Vacaville. And the concept was that you would use this for tracking their whereabouts, and if they were uh, off restricted locations, or there was a certain kind of discharge from their brain, you could then transmit a signal to them to arrest their behavior so that they could be picked up by the police. Uh, he's also funded by Army Intelligence. Army Intelligence funded Neil Birch. Army Intelligence funded Robert Heath at Tulane, who did brain electrode implant research. We saw him on the previous page. The Office of Naval Research funded Jose Delgado at Yale, who did brain electrode implant research. This is the guy that Harold Leaf sent a patient into. His experiments include sticking electrodes in brains, as I mentioned, and then pouring in various types of hallucinogens to see what would be the effect on their perception, their behavior, and electrical activity in the brain. This guy, Jose Delgado, who's tightly in network, he's famous for a videotape of a bull charging at him, and then he pushes the transmitter box, which sends a signal to the electrode implanted in the bull's brain, and the, brain, the bull turns away. He also has a series of papers, which are in my Jose Delgado file, where he does this kind of research on cats. And he refers to the cats that he's got brain electrodes in that he's controlling by a transmitter as mechanical toys, which by loose association remains, reminds me of a book called Man, the Mechanical Misfit, written by G.H. Estabrooks. He also describes a technical innovation in an 11-year-old boy who had brain electrodes implanted for non-therapeutic reasons. Previously, you had to have wires connecting the transmitter box directly to the electrode terminals that were sticking through the skull. In this 11-year-old boy, however, Jose Delgado had figured out how to have a remote transmitter without a direct wire connection. He describes pushing a button in this otherwise normal 11-year-old boy's brain transmitter box, and the boy starts uh, being confused about his identity wondering whether he's a girl and talking about wanting to marry Jose Delgado. He pushes another button and this behavior stops. Another experiment with a 16-year-old girl who looks like maybe a mild borderline, premorbidly, involves sticking these brain electrodes in and there's actually pictures in the paper that you photocopy when you go to the medical school library that's in a journal on the shelf where in one picture she's got this vacant stupid grin on her face, push another button on the panel box and she's pounding the wall. So they are showing actual photographs of markedly different behavioral states, totally controlled by remote transmitters and brain electrode implants. But, you know, the, these guys wouldn't be using hypnosis to create mentoring candidates. Let's look at the temporal lobe epilepsy military mind control research story just for a minute. Let's try and think about the history of multiple personality disorder. What are some of the bogus reasons why MPD is not real. Well, one of the big arguments is this, it's really temporal lobe epilepsy. So we know that temporal lobe epilepsy has been used as one of the arms of Manchurian candidate denial. Okay, well, here we have how that little network works. We got Robert Heath, who's doing non-therapeutic brain electrode implants plus brain electrode implants on temporal lobe epilepsy subjects. That's all funded by military intelligence and the CIA. We've got temporal lobe epilepsy as a phenomenon. Mark Frank Irvin, who's recruited by Jolly West to the UCLA Violence Project, and Mark Sweet write a book called Violence in the Brain, where they're describing doing brain electrode implant experiments on people with temporal lobe epilepsy. One of their subjects had a very unusual form of temporal lobe epilepsy. He was driving a truck in Los Angeles and blanked out and came to in Phoenix. 
So actually, these people were doing brain electrode implants on multiples. Uh, Jolly West said, uh, well, there was, it could be alcoholics, but the, the description, remember this guy drove a truck from UCLA to Phoenix. That's a little bit much for a bl alcohol blackout. But some of the other case histories clearly sound dissociative in nature. But they're calling them temporal lobe epilepsy, just like Jolly West said Jock Ruby had temporal lobe epilepsy. There, and there's this uh, misinformation in the literature that DID is actually due to temporal lobe epilepsy, and there's nine authors of a series of papers in the early to mid-1980s pumping this DID is really temporal lobe epilepsy line. So this shows you how this research works, because I haven't done this, but the hypothesis is now these nine authors are somehow going to be in network. So the odds are the nine authors of the papers published in the 80s saying that DID is really just temporal lobe epilepsy, they're going to be in network in this mind control old boy network somehow. I just haven't researched that up. Okay, borderline personality disorder, when multiples are really just borderlines, is another backup strategy. How does borderline personality disorder tie up with military mind control research? Well, DID is the iatrogenic. They're really just borderlines. Martin Orn says that. Uh, Richard Offshe says that. Martin Orn worked for MKUltra. MKUltra is connected to MK Naomi. MK Naomi was also conducted at Edgeware Arsenal. Edgeware Arsenal is a place where Amadeo Marazzi worked. Amadeo Marazzi did LSD research for uh, the Air Force in uh, Minnesota. And it was funded by Air Force Intelligence. Robert Heath also did LSD research. LSD research was done by Nazi scientists and war criminals. Nazi scientists and war criminals were imported into Edgeware Arsenal frequently. And one of the people that I researched was, uh, uh, I forget his first name now, Wagner Jorg. Good morning and welcome to another International Connection and Happy Easter to everybody out there. We are in part three of a uh, lecture by uh, Dr. Colin Ross. This uh, lecture was called The CIA and Military Mind Control Research, Building the Manchurian Candidate. And this is the uh, first segment in uh, an extended series on mind control in Canada. Uh, next week we'll be featuring an interview with Dr. Colin Ross. Um, if uh, people are interested in where to get hold of audio tapes of this uh, program or transcripts, you can give me a call at uh, 595-1655 during the show or shortly after. This lecture was given at the 9th Annual Western Clinic Conference on Trauma and Dissociation in Orange County, California on April 18th, 1996. And it's very uh, suspicious, uh, I would say, that uh, we have... Uh, in the news, uh, the uh, cult group that uh, has just so-called uh, supposedly committed mass suicide in San Diego and uh, immediate comparisons to Jonestown, as we're going to hear today and as we heard last week of Jonestown's connections to the CIA mind control programs and um, also the, uh, the Solar Temple uh, suicides as well in Quebec and... Um, if you remember, the, there was uh, news coverage, for example, Radio Canada announced that the Solar Temple had financed itself through uh, arms smuggling, laundering its money through BCCI, which is well known for its CIA connections as well. So it, I think people have to ask themselves uh, what's behind these, uh, these events and uh, not to take uh, it at media's face value. Now we're going to play Dr. Colin Ross. Other person who was brought in through Paperclip or another related project was Albertus Strughold. Albertus Strughold is regarded as the father of aviation medicine. There's a library named after him at uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. Uh, he was honored by the Daughters of the American Revolution for his contribution to aviation medicine, and the Texas State Legislature declared uh, a one-time state memorial day named after him in, I believe it was the 1960s. Albertus Strugold was not a nice person. People on his own administrative level, people who reported to him and people that he reported to were all uh, tried and found guilty at Nuremberg of war crimes. He was not even interviewed by the U.S. lawyers responsible for that sector of Nuremberg. The types of experiments that these people did included things like uh, putting people in a pressure chamber and dropping the pressure instantly to about 60,000 feet to simulate somebody being blown out of a cockpit if they were a U.S. pilot. 
what would happen then is they would uh, claw at their faces, experience excruciating pain, uh, and die, uh, either uh, actually die or almost die. The ones who died uh, would be taken out of the chamber, their heads would be cut open, then their heads would be submerged under water, their brains would then be sliced open to determine whether there was air emboli in their cerebral arteries. Another type of experiment done by these people was to attempt to find an antidote to seawater so that down German pilots in the North Sea could drink seawater. So these people were given uh, forced feedings of seawater for days on end, which then would be doctored with various different substances to see whether any of the substances would prevent these subjects from dying. This is major full tilt Nazi doctor war crime stuff. And probably over a thousand of these uh, kind of scientists were brought in over under Project Paperclip. The uh, Nazi war criminals were examined by a team of psychiatrists, including Ewan Cameron, who did LSD and mescaline research, who was an MK Ultra contractor. LSD and mescaline research was also funded by uh, MK Ultra, and mescaline research was done by the Nazi war criminals in the uh, prisoner of war camps. So you and Cameron probably got the bright idea of LSD and mescaline research from the Nazi war criminals. And according to this book, which is not real rock solid in its documentation, he was still in network up in the early 1960s when uh, the U-2 pilot went down. So the only people who are missing from this fully, completely documented history are the psychological warfare experts. It is not possible that the only kind of scientists out of the full range of military expertise that were not brought over was the psychological warfare experts. And uh, um, a guy who was a um, uh, deep ops character in Vietnam described being out in the field and coming across uh, U.S. and V.C. personnel who were all totally wasted on some sort of hallucinogen trip. And their job would simply be to extract these guys and leave the VC who are just completely out of it on the ground. Uh, he, he told me which, uh, which specific uh, location in the United States would be the most likely place to find some of these uh, paperclip psychological warfare experts, so I'm going to pursue that. Let's just take a look at the brain electrode implant research. Now let's say it's just not believable that the CIA and the military have been creating Manchurian candidates. It's too much. It's science fiction. Well, what do we know for a fact that they've been doing? We know that they've been giving kids, uh, if you do milligrams per kilogram or micrograms per kilogram, big time street doses of LSD, days, weeks, and months, and a year, up to years in a row. We know that they've been implanting non-therapeutic brain electrodes in children as young as 11 years old on an experimental basis. And we know that they've been wiping out people's entire personal histories with 102 ECT treatments and massive sleep induction through drugs for no therapeutic reason whatsoever. But we don't think they would go as far as creating a Manchurian candidate. So it doesn't add up. What we know for an absolute documented fact is that they've gone way beyond monkeying around with some amnesia barriers and new identities. So what's the story on brain electrode implant research? Oh, here's a name you might recognize. Well, brain electrode implant research was funded by the CIA and MK Ultra in conjunction with the Office of Naval Research. There's a lot of joint funding of various projects by Office of Naval Research and the CIA. The Office of Naval Research funded both Neil Birch and the CIA. And Neil Birch published that thing by Jolly West. Jolly West started the UCLA Violence Project, which was going to be at Vacaville, which is where Donald DeFries was. He recruited a brain electrode implant psychiatrist who was part of a brain electrode implant team at Harvard, Frank Irvin, to be part of the UCLA Violence Project. He denies in his chapter in the book by Neil Birch that there was any intention to do brain electrode implants, but the available evidence suggests that actually, in fact, the plan was to stick brain electrodes in some of these prisoners at Vacaville, and the concept was that you would use this for tracking their whereabouts, and if they were uh, off restricted locations, or there was a certain kind of discharge from their brain, you could then transmit a signal to them to arrest their behavior so that they could be picked up by the police. 
Uh, he's also funded by Army Intelligence. Army Intelligence funded Neil Birch. Army Intelligence funded Robert Heath at Tulane, who did brain electrode implant research. We saw him on the previous page. The Office of Naval Research funded Jose Delgado at Yale, who did brain electrode implant research. This is the guy that Harold Leaf sent a patient into. His experiments include sticking electrodes in brains, as I mentioned, and then pouring in various types of hallucinogens to see what would be the effect on their perception, their behavior, and electrical activity in the brain. This guy, Jose Delgado, who's tightly in network, he's famous for a videotape of a bull charging at him, and then he pushes the transmitter box, which sends a signal to the electrode implanted in the bull's brain, and the, brain, the bull turns away. He also has a series of papers, which are in my Jose Delgado file, where he does this kind of research on cats, and he refers to the cats that he's got brain electrodes in that he's controlling by a transmitter as mechanical toys, which by loose association remains, reminds me of a book called Man, the Mechanical Misfit, written by G.H. Esterbrooks. He also describes a technical innovation in an 11-year-old boy who had brain electrodes implanted for non-therapeutic reasons. Previously, you had to have wires connecting the transmitter box directly to the electrode terminals that were sticking through the skull. In this 11-year-old boy, however, Jose Delgado had figured out how to have a remote transmitter without a direct wire connection. He describes pushing a button in this otherwise normal 11-year-old boy's brain transmitter box, and the boy starts uh, being confused about his identity wondering whether he's a girl and talking about wanting to marry Jose Delgado. He pushes another button and this behavior stops. Another experiment with a 16-year-old girl who looks like maybe a mild borderline, premorbidly, involves sticking these brain electrodes in and there's actually pictures in the paper that you photocopy when you go to the medical school library that's in a journal on the shelf where in one picture she's got this vacant stupid grin on her face, push another button on the panel box and she's pounding the wall. So they are showing actual photographs of markedly different behavioral states totally controlled by remote transmitters and brain electrode impacts. But, you know, the, these guys wouldn't be using hypnosis to create Manchurian candidates. Let's look at the temporal lobe epilepsy military mind control research story just for a minute. Let's try and think about the history of multiple personality disorder. What are some of the bogus reasons why MPD is not real. Well, one of the big arguments is this, it's really temporal lobe epilepsy. So we know that temporal lobe epilepsy has been used as one of the arms of Manchurian candidate denial. Okay, well, here we have how that little network works. We got Robert Heath, who's doing non-therapeutic brain electrode implants plus brain electrode implants on temporal lobe epilepsy subjects. That's all funded by military intelligence and the CIA. We've got temporal lobe epilepsy as a phenomena. Mark Frank Irvin, who's recruited by Jolly West to the UCLA Violence Project, and Mark Sweet write a book called Violence in the Brain, where they're describing doing brain electrode implant experiments on people with temporal lobe epilepsy. One of their subjects had a very unusual form of temporal lobe epilepsy. He was driving a truck in Los Angeles and blanked out and came to in Phoenix. So actually, these people were doing brain electrode implants on multiples. Uh, Jolly West said, uh, well, there was, it could be alcoholics, but the, the description, remember this guy drove a truck from UCLA to Phoenix. That's a little bit much for alcohol blackout. But some of the other case histories clearly sound dissociative in nature. But they're calling them temporal lobe epilepsy, just like Jolly West said Jock Ruby had temporal lobe epilepsy. There, there's this uh, misinformation in the literature that DID is actually due to temporal lobe epilepsy, and there's nine authors of a series of papers in the early to mid-1980s pumping this DID is really temporal lobe epilepsy line. So this shows you how this research works, because I haven't done this, but the hypothesis is now these nine authors are somehow going to be in network. So the odds are the nine authors of the papers published in the 80s saying that DID is really just temporal lobe epilepsy they're going to be in network in this mind control old boy network somehow. I just haven't researched that up. Okay, borderline personality disorder. When multiples are really just borderlines is another backup strategy. How does borderline personality disorder tie up with military mind control research? Well, DID is the atrogenic. They're really just borderlines. 
that Martin Orn says that. Uh, Richard Offshe says that. Martin Orn worked for MK Ultra. MK Ultra is connected to MK Naomi. MK Naomi was also conducted at Edgeware Arsenal. Edgeware Arsenal is a place where Amadeo Marazzi worked. Amadeo Marazzi did LSD research for uh, the Air Force in uh, Minnesota. And it was funded by Air Force Intelligence. Robert Heath also did LSD research. LSD research was done by Nazi scientists and war criminals. Nazi scientists and war criminals were imported into Edgeware Arsenal frequently. And one of the people that I researched was, uh, uh, I forget his first name now, Wagner Jorg, who apparently is the son of the Wagner Jorg who won a Nobel Prize for treating syphilis with malaria. I haven't researched that up fully, but he came over to Edgeware Arsenal, and uh, I have him publishing research. I have him documented as being a German university professor in the 1930s and 40s, showing up at Edgeware Arsenal and publishing research on antidotes to chemical warfare weapons and saying that he regrets the extremely long period of time during which it was impossible to publish this research data. Uh, so he did that research at Edgeware Arsenal, which overlaps with the time that Amadeo, Amadeo Marazzi was there, who did LSD research uh, at the University of Minnesota. Another person who did LSD research is Paul Hawk. Paul Hawk worked for the CIA and is one of the inventors of the term borderline personality disorder. So this is a little bit hokey, this one. But it just shows you, the theme here is not that there's a military intelligence conspiracy to cover up Manchurian candidate creation with a myth of borderline personality disorder. The point now is sort of a, a more global general meta point, which is this whole network of old boys in psychiatry and psychology who are covertly funded, who are part of the military CIA intelligence mind control network, are very influential in the history of psychiatry in a kind of nebulous fashion that just permeates the whole field that isn't part of these sort of one-to-one -one correspondences like I've been showing before. So it's a matter of the whole mindset of psychiatry, how we think about borderline, how we think about tep temporal lobe epilepsy, what are we going to react to MPD like? Well, we're going to react to MPD because... So it's more, a little bit more vague, it's a little bit more global, it's a little more general. But the point is that the history of psychiatry in the second half of the 20th century has undoubtedly been strongly skewed, not by an agenda that has to do with academic research, not by the best interest of clients, not by ethical psychiatry, but by an intelligence agenda. My beef is not with the intelligence community or the CIA, it's with the psychiatrists and the psychologists who've created a little loophole where they can step out of normal ethical oversight, violate the Hippocratic Oath, get away with it, not talk about it, and just like the conspiracy to keep incest under the carpet, this is all conspired and kept under the carpet, not by 12 guys in a room at Langley who are doing the planning, but just by this pervasive old boy network that's keeping the mind control secret down just like it kept the incest secret down. So that's another reason this is important and needs to be uncovered. Uh, that's the end of the slides. Now I'm going to come back to Jonestown a little bit and fill you in on Jonestown. And then I see that I'm way ahead of schedule, which is fine because I've got a lot more to tell you. Plus, you can ask a whole bunch of questions and we can have a discussion. According to this Jonestown book, oh, I, um, remember that uh, there's a connection between um, Patty Hearst's being kidnapped by Donald DeFreeze, who's mind controlled by Colson Westbrook, who's a CIA psy war expert. And then there's the food relief program for uh, the ransom by Jim Jones, who's being hassled by William Handol Randolph Hearst's newspaper that ties into Russell Means being on the board. Well, according to a person who survived the white night at Jonestown, Patty Hearst's boyfriend, Stephen Weed, was on site at the People's Temple in Ukiah and observed talking to Jim Jones three months before the kidnapping. So, if that is true, I mean, that just blows the coincidence conspiracy theory out of the water. It's too much not to be all connected up. According to the book, there's pretty solid documentation that Jim Jones was... Uh, recruited by the CIA way back in the 50s, and he was a course of persuasion brainwashing expert who uh, had some churches in Cincinnati 
and then moved out to California. He specialized in course of persuasion on blacks and Native Americans. Almost all of the people at Jonestown were not white except the elite who survived. And he was on site in two European, uh, South American countries, I think Brazil and British Guiana, as a CIA undercover operative doing typical CIA operations as part of government overthrow by stirring up left-wing factions, stirring up labor, uh, distributing leaflets, and so on. So he was actually part of standard CIA operations going way back into the 50s. Um, the evidence in favor of it actually being a drug experiment is pretty weak. He says there was drug A, drug B, and placebo. And the point of the experiment was, do either of the active drugs enhance the voluntary completed suicide rate of the brainwashed subjects? But he doesn't really provide any documentation to support that. He just sort of pulls that out of nowhere. So that's not very plausible. Also, he talks about MKUltra in a non-scholarly way because MKUltra had already stopped, so it wasn't technically an MKUltra operation. Um, there's a lot of, I can't remember all the detail in the book, but there's a lot of elaborate detail about, uh, for instance, Jim Jones uh, visited Castro. Um, there's a lot of connections between the CIA being the site for Jonestown in British Guiana before they went there, and all kinds of visiting back and forth from CIA station in the capital of Guiana to the People's Temple. Like I said, one of those daughters in the Leighton family was escorted out of Jonestown just before White Night by the CIA station chief. And um, it, it just builds up like that. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of these kind of documented pieces of information. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff about particular people who were assassinated by the People's Temple and uh, a bunch of uh, numerological type code and letter type code for how these people were selected and how their last names uh, mirrored the method by which they were killed. So there's a whole just vast ton of detail that leaves me with a net conclusion that it's beyond coincidence. Whether it actually was a medical experiment uh, is not really clearly established, except the most compelling fact is the method of delivery of the drugs. Every night, every member of the Jonestown commune had to go to the kitchen and eat one cookie in front of personnel. And he says the cookie is where the drugs were delivered. So I, I would say the net conclusion is that it's probably more than 50-50% likely that there was some sort of heavy CIA involvement in Jonestown, whether or not there was a drug experiment. In terms of how many people actually committed suicide, according to this book, actually only a minority of people committed suicide. Many were shot or injected uh, with a cyanide. Only a minority actually dr <clears throat> drank it voluntarily. And when you look at the configuration of bodies on the ground, these are people who just drank, died, and fell on the ground. They're all lined up in orderly rows. Uh, there's a whole deal about how uh, one of the latent family members was her identity was switched with somebody else who had lung cancer and she was actually escorted off the grounds on the grounds of having lung cancer but it was somebody else who had the lung cancer and there's substitution of bodies there's a claim that the guy who was identified as being Jim Jones was not actually Jim Jones so you have you have to read the book to get the whole wealth of detail but I'd say it's fairly compelling and persuasive which takes us back into how come all these guys who are connected into network tend to be experts in mind control, brainwashing, course of persuasion, destructive cults? And why is it that destructive cults appear to specialize in creating Manchurian candidates? So it's, you just keep going round and round this network, and the more you research into it, this is only like part way along the journey. If you actually had a team of like 10 researchers, you would end up with like 50 of these slides with every some of it speculative but every connection fully documented on 50 slides so another another curious twist on this story is the history of LSD one of the things that goes on is there's always information and disinformation one of the strategies for disinformation is what's called a limited hangout a limited hangout is when you let out a little bit of the truth and then you go well see we fessed up but actually you only let out 3%. And the purpose of the limited hangout is to cover up the rest. So we, there's always a limited hangout going on. Every time a bunch of stuff is declassified, that's only the tip of the iceberg. 
If we take a look at the history of LSD, something that was not taught to me when I was a psychiatry resident is who were the original acid heads? Could have been like maybe Beatniks or maybe Allen Ginsberg or could have been Ken Kesey maybe. No, the original acid heads in North America were the leading figures in psychiatry. The people who imported LSD into North America were the CIA and the military. It didn't get here through street or drug dealer routes. It got here through official military CIA mind control research mechanisms. And the CIA at one time actually considered buying up the world supply of LSD from Sandoz. But like I said, their alternative backup was to contract with Eli Lilly to provide a secure supply of LSD. So these guys were on acid trips in the first half of the 1950s. Uh, people who first got turned on to LSD as subjects in military experiments included uh, Gregory Bateson, uh, Allen Ginsberg, Ken Kesey, um, probably Timothy Leary. Gregory Bateson uh, was married to Margaret Mead, who was funded in her anthropological work by the CIA. There's a whole another dimension of this, which is funding. This is a fact. In you're listening to CKLN. We're about halfway through the lecture on uh, the third part of the lecture by Dr. Colin Ross on the uh, CIA's history in creating Manchurian candidates. Um, just to remind you, Dr. Ross is uh, giving this information. Uh, all of this is documented from uh, CIA's own documents obtained through the Freedom of Information Act. We're now going to start the uh, second half of the tape of this third part of the lecture. You're listening to CKLN 88.1. Another story about anthropology, a little glimpse of which we capture from uh, Raymond Prince being funded under MK Ultra to go study the Yoruba. This is called study of mind control techniques by witch doctors around the world. Now Raymond Prince's hypothesis is that actually it's just a way to go undercover into a foreign country and gather information about the culture and establish contact with possible agents and recruits. But the CIA is as part of its proper operations in the Cold War, has had to gather a tremendous amount of data on the stability of different societies and countries that are likely to tip over to communism, which involves sociology, economics, military analysis, and anthropology. Anthropology uh, and languages and linguistics are all part of the operation. So all these people who are the original acid heads are the psychiatrists. And the psychiatrists, when you read the LSD-sponsored symposia, um, the guy who's the archivist currently for the American College of Psychiatrists, whose name is Sidney Mallet, so I plan to contact. The American Psycholo College of Psychiatrists is this old boys power club in American psychiatry that I got into because I got a fellowship from them as a resident. He, he, no, I don't think it was CIA funded. <laughs> uh, unless Mead Johnson was functioning as a cutout. <laughs> the money of, supposedly came from Mead Johnson. Um, but that's the way the network works. I mean, that's a joke, but it could be. You never know. Um, so this guy who's the archivist historian in one of these CIA symposia in the early 1960s talks about how he was turned on to LSD by Paul Hawk, who's the guy who is responsible for the term borderline personality disorder, who killed the tennis pro with mescaline. Well, all these guys are writing and talking about LSD as the hot thing in psychotherapy. They are totally on board with it, and usually they're talking about sub-hallucinogenic doses, like 50 milligrams, 75 milligrams, as loosening up the ego and causing these amazing treatment responses, like curing long-term alcoholism in a single LSD psychotherapy session. They're all getting funded by it, they're getting perked by it, they're going to trips, they're meeting their buddies, they're going to conferences, they're getting published, they're getting books edited. It's all just part of the whole program. Nobody in psychiatry is saying bad stuff, dangerous stuff, street drug, protect the youth of America. They're not talking like that. All of a sudden, boom. It's, an, it's a narcotic and it's outlined by the FDA. What is the initial response 
of all of these gray-haired fathers of psychiatry to making LSD an illegal substance. Protest. It's a bad thing. It's robbing us of a powerful psychotherapeutic agent. It's crippling our research efforts. These guys were hung out to dry. They were used by the intelligence agencies to gather uh, therapeutic use of LSD, interrogation use of LSD, psychotomimetic use of LSD. And then when they had done their job, LSD was just canceled from academia. It was made illegal. And then a whole disinformation campaign went along with that, whereby LSD was transformed from this wonderful therapeutic agent whose use was advocated by the major leading, major leading figures in psychiatry into this horrible thing that made our children jump out of windows and busted up their chromosomes. That's called a disinformation campaign. And it caught the leaders of psychiatry totally by surprise, which is hard to believe since psychiatrists are such clever political strategists in general. Okay. What about this whole creating Manchurian candidate stuff, which we see now for a fact has been going on since the Second World War, and according to Estherbrooks, even back to the First World War. So we now have established for a proven fact that that was going on in the Second World War, and the CIA was working on it in Artichoke and Bluebird, 51 to 53. Well, the Korean War only started in 1950. The disinformation is that our boys went over there, they got shot down, they got captured, the communist Chinese worked on them with these strange techniques we don't understand. <coughs> the person who coined the term brainwashing in a book was named uh, Edwin, I think was his first name, Hunter. He's a career CIA case officer. This was a term that was coined by the CIA to explain what was happening to our boys in North Korea who were making bogus statements about germ warfare activities they've been involved in. Now, it could be that part of the communist brainwashing strategy was to talk to these guys about the ethical impropriety of biological warfare bombing they actually had been doing on North, Vietnam, uh, North Korea. At any rate, they come home as Manchurian candidates. We're all bent out of shape because our boys are talking communism. And so we say that we have got to start studying this stuff reactively and defensively because of what the commies are doing. That is the disinformation myth that's been adhered to by the military intelligence community steadfastly from the Korean War up till the present. It's totally bogus. It's disinformation. It's not a fact. It's a made-up story to cover up the fact that actually we had operational offensive use of this psychological warfare technology already in place in the Second World War. We've got a major disinformation campaign which has basically fooled mental health professions and the general public concerning brainwashing, concerning LSD. Fortunately, those are the only two examples in human history. This analysis does not apply to the false memory movement. There is no way that it could conceivably be possible, you'll all agree, that there could be any nervousness in the intelligence community about Manchurian candidates spilling out into civilian psychotherapies and that a disinformation program based on false memories would be required. That's obviously absurd. Nobody but a CIA conspiracy nut would ever suggest that. So I can guarantee you that that thought has never even crossed my mind until it just spontaneously appeared at this moment. So you see, the, actually, in fact, the idea that there could be a deliberate disinformation campaign element to the false memory movement is perfectly plausible, consistent with history, and to be expected. There is bound to be some sort of disinformation strategy if, in fact, Manchurian candidates have been leaking out into civilian psychotherapies. So here we have, with all of this documentation, all of this proof, we know that it is perfectly possible that people we are seeing in therapy who are claiming to be victims of systematic military mind control experimentation are telling us about what actually happened to them. However, I'm not a single step further ahead than I was four years ago on actually documenting that any single individual patient in treatment actually in fact was involved in these mind control experiments. There is no linkage at all from the current patients in treatment to this documentation. So whether we're ever going to get that or not, I don't know. Um, America Online has on, on site, and there are a number of men that are writing in about mind control and military. Okay, so America Online has a site called On Psych, Psych Online, yeah. And if you get into some of the um, more of the group, right. Um, there is a group called Mind Control and Military. Okay. 
so mind control in the military is a chat group on the inter- on. So, 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 so like a bulletin board more. So those of us who are not internet wizards are all having trouble with this vocabulary. But anyway, there's you're able to access through America Online onto the internet, or it's an Amer- America Online. On Psych. Okay. And there's a bunch of websites. Apparently there's a lot of info about this you know, on, in the web and the internet and America Online and elsewhere. But the problem is, like I've only gone, I don't go to chat rooms that much, but the little bit I've gone is it's mostly just totally banal and silly and boring and a waste of time. So when you go into the stuff on mind control, how much just garbage are you going to get and how much solid stuff that you can pursue and document are you going to get is my question. I have no idea what the answer is. But, as we all know, the truth is out there. I'm curious, you said you haven't had an opportunity or you haven't had a case where you've been in a document. I'm curious, how would you go about documenting? How would I go about documenting uh, that a patient that I currently have in treatment or somebody else currently has in treatment, in fact, was involved in that kind of experimentation? Well, um, here's how the, uh, the documentation has gone so far. The person has, uh, by the way, I've done Freedom of Information Act requests on Monarch at all intelligence agencies and they've all denied that it exists. Um, the patient has apparently no source of contamination for specific Monarch memories, but has the word Monarch in her mind and has a very detailed uh, Monarch mind control type scenario memories. Um, her father uh, basically uh, abused her uh, domestically and ritualistically and then uh, took her over to the mind control people. <clears throat> How she got there, what the transport mechanism was, plane and car, the location's all vague because of, she appears to have been drugged out during transport. Uh, is it possible that her father could have been this kind of person? Well, I have his um, military service record, which I got through the Freedom of Information Act. I have a letter from him in prison where he's imprisoned for uh, mob crime connections. Uh, I've got um, a mother and a sister corroborating the domestic incest, a sister with some patchy corroboration of ritual abuse and military mind control memories. I've got the uh, father personally connected to Jack Ruby. That's as far as it goes. It's sort of circumstantial intriguing. So the way that I would attempt to document it would be if the person tells me, most people can't tell you the specific name of the doctor. But if somebody gives you the specific name of a doctor and gives you a specific location, and then you can establish that this doctor actually existed, then you can establish that, in fact, the doctor was a CIA employee. Then you can establish that this person's father was uh, uh, imprisoned by the FBI as part of a mafia raid by looking at the journal articles that the patient has. Then you're starting to get closer and closer. So it's your basic investigative reporting type stuff. Name a specific base. Okay, what do you know about the base? How did you get there? Tell me about some buildings. Tell me about personnel. Describe uniforms. What was used? And then if you can get another subject who is at the same time, that's just the way it is. It's your basic investigative reporting, which is way beyond being a therapist. I mean, there's no therapeutic obligation to do this. This is mega beyond duty to take collateral history. But I don't think there's any mystery as to how it would proceed. And it'll proceed probably in the same way as the history of declassified information has gone since the Second World War. In about 19, I think, 88, stuff was released to the Senate and the Congress and then was released to the press about all these radiation experiments. But, like, nobody did anything. It didn't even get into the newspapers. It's been in the public domain for five years before it finally hits the newspapers. Now I've got this government report that's 900 pages on all the radiation experiments includes giving radiation to uh, uh, children and radiation to pregnant mothers uh, and the children of those pregnancies dying of leukemia by age five. I mean, this is huge, big stuff. There was just, everybody was apathetic, didn't think it was really newsworthy, didn't even put it as a little trailer item you know, in the New York Times. But this is no longer vague. We know the specific names of the people, when they died, whether it was plutonium or what it was that was injected, 
the names of the doctors, the medical schools it was done at, and it's all teed up for compensation. The government has set up a whole compensation mechanism. If we look at the Tuskegee syphilis study, anybody ever heard of the Tuskegee syphilis study? Tuskegee syphilis study is worse than creation of mentoring candidates. It was set up in Tuskegee, in which is Georgia, right? Or Alabama, Georgia, Alabama. Uh, in the 1940s. The experiment is you've got 400, they're all rural, 1940s, dirt poor, black guys with active syphilis, 400 of them, and 400 controls. These people are followed prospectively without treatment into the 1970s. The people who are involved in the Tuskegee syphilis study include a huge long list I can't remember all the details on, but it includes like the County Medical Society, the administration of the study in the 60s was actually taken over by the Center of Disease Control, uh, the Surgeon General, the American Heart Association, all kinds of people were witting, knowledgeable, and aware of the study and approved its ongoing nature well into the 60s and even into the 1970s in complete violation of all known methodical ethics. Well, okay, so that was kept kind of secret. Nobody heard about it except some of these medical bigwigs. No, I have a 1965 paper that I photocopied at the medical school called Untreated Syphilis in the Male Negro, a 20-Year Follow-Up. This stuff is published right in the medical literature. It's looking everybody right in the face. What happens when you have 400 illiterate rural black guys with active syphilis untreated for 40 years? Well, the outcome of the experiment is you'll be very surprised to hear they don't do too well, they develop a lot of disease, and they die young. They do another thing. They breathe air. There's another behavior that we can predict of these guys, that is they eat food. Going down the list, they urinate and defecate. Continuing on with basic human functions, they have cis sexual intercourse with women. Anybody who's been to medical school will tell you it is 100% guaranteed that if you take 400 black guys with syphilis and do not treat them for the rest of their lives, you are guaranteed to be creating cases of congenital syphilis. The entire medical community knows this for an elementary fact that you learn in first year medical school. It's published in the medical literature and is condoned by all levels of the old boy network in world medicine. This is totally unbelievable and completely factual. So, like, this Manchurian Candidate stuff is like the little Mickey Mouse psych stuff. It's not even heavy duty. So all of this, I mean, you can, the uh, nurse who was the head of the Tuskegee syphilis study throughout its duration actually got an award from the Public Health Service because of her work on the Tuskegee syphilis study. So the, now, some of these guys, the individual guys have gone and testified at the Senate. You can read the book called Bad Blood, and these guys are named as individual human beings. Which individual human beings who are victims of military mind control research do we already know? Harold Blower, the tennis pro who was killed. Frank Olson was killed because he jumped through a window because he took LSD mixed with Quantro administered by Sidney Gottlieb, administrative head of MK Ultra that I've talked to on the telephone. When was the Olson family uh, compensated? He died in like 1955 or something. They were compensated by the president in 1977, I think it was. The reason they figured out what happened, this is the children and the surviving mother. The reason they figured out that, in fact, this was not just a simple suicide was they read the Rockefeller Report on CIA activities published in 1975 in which the case was described without him being named. So they're reading the Rockefeller Report and they realize that their father actually was killed by experimental LSD and they're compensated for three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, one of the people who testified at the uh, committee hearings in the Senate in 1975 uh, was a, a technician for Amadeo Mer uh, Marazzi, who was the guy who was the head of Edgeware Arsenal, where Paul Hawk got his LSD and mescaline from, who was uh, funded by the Air Force while he was at the University of Minnesota. His research assistant, whose name is Mary Ray, was given a dose of LX experimental LSD, uh, which resulted in an acute psychotic state for which he was admitted to the hospital, for which I have the medical record. 
uh, and I'm in contact with a lawyer. I'm going to go up and interview her and get her story in more detail. She talks about a room that was involved in the LSD research, which was called the Leaf Room. So when you were on your acid trip, administered by Amadeo Marazzi, you would be taken into the Leaf Room, which is a room, all surfaces of the room were totally covered with leaves. This is weird stuff. Uh, she also is connected to a bunch of other stuff that actually is just like I'm not going to go into all of it because it's a little weird but it's uh, two hops from Mary Ray to Iran Contra so she is a real person who exists I know her lawyer, I talked to her lawyer on the phone I'm going to fly up there, I'm going to interview her I have the medical record and the way this works is the, the stuff that happens now is not going to be declassified for 20 or 25 years. Eventually, we will have the names of people who were victims of these experiments in the 70s and 80s and the 90s. We already have their names for the 50s and the 60s, not really into the 70s. We have the names of specific people who were victims of the Tuskegee syphilis study and the radiation experiments into the 70s. So that's just the way it goes. It's just You're just pushing back that curtain, and there's always this lag time because you're relying on, you equals the intelligence community, you're relying on public apathy. And, oh, well, it was back in the Cold War, and it's different now, and we joined the Boy Scouts of America, and we don't do that anymore. So there's always a disinformation strategy for why it happened a long time ago. We don't do it now. We're very regretful. And we're so regret regretful that, in fact, we agree to compensate these victims. In the radiation experiments, it was Oregon. I think Oregon. Yeah, Oregon. There's a prison in Oregon where uh, men were paid to be subjects to participate in radiation experiments and what they uh, had done was their testicles were irradiated so they would get paid a certain fee to participate in irradiation of their testicles uh, special arrangements were made uh, so that Catholics didn't participate in the study because they couldn't use birth control therefore they might give birth to genetically mutated children so it had to be only non-Catholic participants and then there was an extra fee that was a little bit fatter if you would agree to have your testicle biopsy to see whether the radiation was dropping your sperm count. When nine of these people uh, pressed their case to the state legislature in Oregon in either the late 70s or early 80s, in its magnanimity, the uh, legislature agreed to compensate them for a total of 2000 and some dollars for all nine subjects. So this is the way it goes with trying to document this stuff and get it made public and identify the specific individuals. It's a big, slow job. And when you make Freedom of Information Act requests, it's like interacting with any federal bureaucracy. In fact, the CIA has been extremely helpful, extremely polite, very courteous. Um, and when I went to the CIA reading room in Washington, which is a very unusual experience, well, let me just tell you the story because it's kind of a good story. So here I am, a uh, Canadian psychiatrist, walking, going down to the Eastern Regional Conference, and the day early... I pop over to the CIA reading room to look at the MK Ultra documents to figure out which ones I want to order at 10 cents a page, which they then ship to me, which arrives at, in my office on, from UPS with Central Intelligence Agency stamped in the corner. <laughs> I'm wondering who thinks that's weird. So I show up, and it's just this building in uh, Virginia on a street that's completely unrecognizable, doesn't look like anything. I get dropped off there. I walk in, like, whoo, there's all these guys in uniforms. And now here I'm this civilian, and on the wall it says, Secured Telephone, uh, CIA and DIA only. And I'm kind of standing around, and some, says, some guy says, Good morning, sir. And <laughs> so I say, Well, I'm here uh, to read some CIA documents. I'm supposed to show up at this uh, location at this time, and here's the letter. And, and they're going, CIA, geez. And then it's like, Who are we going to phone? Did, are you supposed to tell somebody you're here, or how's this supposed to work? Well, I don't know. Uh, I was just told to show up here. I says, well, well, we don't know who's supposed to meet you. So then I say, well, could I use your phone? He says, yeah, not that phone. This, this phone over here. So then I phone my secretary, like, what's the telephone number of the contact person? So she gives it to me, and I say, well, you're, okay, you're supposed to contact this person at this phone number. Oh, it's okay. Uh, we found out who it is. They're going to be down in a minute. So then I sign in. I'm escorted up the elevator. It's all like military guys, and I'm sitting on the elevator <laughs> thinking... Now, which one of these guys is doing surveillance on me? I come up to the floor, and we're walking along, and it's a federal building. Like, the floor is under repair. There's all kinds of construction stuff lying around, and construction guys. And 
I go walking down the corridor accompanied by the CIA person, and I go into the first room, which has got like a steel vault door, and it says Secured Area Treasury Department. So I go into that room, they close the door, I'm now in a secured area. She says, uh, okay, uh, sign in here. I think I signed in, I forget. And then I go through another secured steel door into a second secured area, because I can't enter that secured area except from another secured space. And then I sit down, and they bring in all the documents on a, a little cart, and she gives me like 15 or 20 pencils, beautifully sharpened. And there's a, and a notepad and everything. It's, here's, you order which documents you want at the end of the day. And there's a woman who's at least 80, if not 85, who's a retired volunteer sitting there watching me all day. But I'm in the room that I'm in that's a secured space. The doorway is open back to the hallway that I came down from the elevator to go into the first secured space to go into the... Se <laughs> so then I'm sitting there working away on this huge amount of documents all day like just work 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 somewhere in the middle of the day this old woman so i'm thinking now is this old woman trying to pump me for information what's her report going to be back at the end of the day she says well what's that stuff you're reading and i'm trying to act cash i just say well it's just a bunch of you know mind control documents from the 50s and 60s she says well is that stuff classified i said no no it's declassified a long time ago she says so what do they need me here for i go I don't know. And I stopped talking to her and focused down on my paper. So then I get distracted by a couple of black guys who are walking down the corridor who have something to do with the construction. The 85-year-old white-haired woman who's watching me has to go to the restroom, so they're assigned to watch me from the door. And they're, they're like some black guys who start joking around, about, oh, this guy's pretty dangerous. We'll have to watch him. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, I leave. That's my experience. <laughs> So, but, but the, uh, the main contact person is like very friendly, very polite, very efficient, very helpful. And it's through this process. I mean, they've given me these documents. They're the ones who've made it possible to prove that the CIA has been creating Manchurian candidates. But I've got all these other requests in on MK Search and all this MK Nomi and stuff. And I'm going to put one in on Stargate. Uh, if you want to do a request on an individual, it turns out that you have to... Uh, establish his place and date of birth, his full name, his date of death, the fact that he was an American citizen, citizen, and you have to have public documentation of his death before they will do a search, which is protecting proper protection of people. So you've got to do all of this background research to find out, like, when did Carl Pfeiffer die, and where did he die, and get a newspaper clipping from Atlanta to document that. Then you send all that information into them, and you ask for information on this particular guy, and they send you back the MK Ultra document that you already have, that you already know is due to him, except now his name's not whited out. So a lot of it is just kind of like dealing with the federal bureaucracy, and it's just really, really, really slow. And they say, like, we've, you know, we've only got two secretaries, and we've got a million requests, and we're too overloaded, and we don't have our new computer system, and we can't get this stuff to you, but we're working on it. And it's just a very, very, very slow, laborious process to get this stuff Especially if it's, if it's already declassified and it's indexed, then you can get it fairly quickly, like the MKUltra stuff. If it's just being organized, it isn't yet officially declassified, then you get in a line. And you're piggybacked on top of the first requester. When the first requester gets the stuff, you'll get it as well. And so, like MK Search, I've been working for a couple of years already. So you're try it's like you know, trying to change the way agriculture is administered in the United States. It's this huge, laborious process. You're just trying to egg the bureaucracy on and on and on and on. But just to kind of repeat the editorial comment, basically I don't have a beef with the intelligence agencies. My beef is with the psychiatrists and the psychologists. Other question or comment at all? Do you know whether or not if you are being surveyed or... Do I know if I'm being surveyed? There's... Well, I've been approached by millions of people at conferences. I don't know if any of them are operatives or not. I have no, I've had no, like, negative, scary, frightening, intimidation, threat. Uh, my office has not been broken into. doesn't look, nothing about mail tampering. Nothing's gone missing. Uh, no patients have done anything really dangerous and weird towards me. Nobody's disappeared. You know, no dead chickens on my doorstep. Uh, you know, nobody's hustled me into a black car and all of a sudden I'm in Topeka, Kansas, and I don't know how I got there. 
nothing like that has happened. Uh, so I just assume that if it hasn't happened by now, it's already too late. Like, what's the point? Uh, so part of this whole story, which I didn't get into, is the personal side of it is how do you work your way through all this material and get more and more and more and more and more of these connections and not succumb to terminal paranoia? And it's really just sort of a Zen <laughs> of not the Zen of investigating military mind control. I mean, you just have to stay centered and decide not to be paranoid and not let it get to you. And because you can get off into like how many witnesses to the JFK assassination are dead and what about Pan Am 103 and what about Timothy McVeigh's computer chip in his buttock and I mean, you, you can really get out there real fast. Tim, when he was first arrested, Timothy McVeigh said that he had a computer chip implanted in his buttock. So on the, and, but on the other hand, I would assume, like, I hope that the intelligence agencies are not so fast asleep. I mean, basically, I was saying to John, it's narcissistically injurious to think that they're not paying any attention at all. I can't take that. <laughs> <laughs> and I know for a fact they have a file on me because I've filed millions of Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, and the other thing I know is that I got my green card in 1994 uh, at the highest level of green card there is. It's a level where you don't have to even have a job uh, or any visible sign of report. And I got this immigration lawyer who you know, put in my whole CV and all my publications and letters from people and stuff together. And so that involves, a, obviously, a security screen uh, by the State Department, which means connected to justice and connected to the FBI and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I know I've been screened through, uh, you know, all that kind of mechanism and come out. In fact, the, uh, I had to go to Calgary for the green card and the, the consulate there came up and shook my hand and said, Boy, I bet you we got a lot of disassociation disorders right here. <laughs> we could really use you. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think they're trying to pretend that they're never going to get uncovered and just carry on with life and enjoy their retirements. Overall, overall, what's going on now? Um, I assume that there's still a lot of funding of research through cutouts with unwitting investigators. I assume there's a bunch of witting investigators. There's another... Let's see here. Oh, we've got 10 minutes. Let me tell you about another arm that I know is going on currently. That's artificial intelligence uh, research. And I know that, um, for instance, Marvin Mursky at MIT, in his book, The Society of Mind, he acknowledges extensive Office of Naval Research funding. That goes back to John Lilly, who uh, is tied into the LSD network, who treated dolphins with LSD, who's involved in communication with dolphins. Dolphins, for a documented fact, have been used to uh, swim up to ships to blow them up with bombs attached to the dolphins in the Vietnam War. Uh, we hear weird stuff from patients sometimes about dolphins and mind control. Uh, John Lewis tied into the LSD network, and it, uh, I've got him attending CIA-sponsored LSD symposia. He invented the flotation tank, Flotation tank research is in network and all the sensory deprivation stuff and mixed in with hallucinogens. And he wrote a program on metaprogramming in the human computer, which is a early artificial intelligence treatise that basically defines a modularity model of the human mind, which is the dominant model uh, of neural networks, all that area of artificial intelligence, and a whole bunch of different Office of Naval Research funding. And that is ongoing up to the present. So there's Office of Naval Research funding for that kind of research. Also for um, rat physiology, rat psychology research that has to do with modularity of brain functions and modularity of memory, which all is directly relevant to creating Manchurian candidates because you want to know the modular organization of the brain. So which hypothesis now? question you're assuming that I might have the answer the answer is if the hypothesis is that now I'm not saying like everybody on the false memory syndrome advisory board consciously is aware of this most of them are like totally out to lunch I've never heard of it or thought of it the point would be that the intelligence agencies have somehow penetrated the false memory movement and are trying to spin it in that direction and amplify it for those purposes and candidate people 
for uh, intelligence oversight would include Martin Orn, uh, Jolly West, Richard Offshe, etc. Maybe Michael Persinger. Um, so if that's the hypothesis, and it, the basic thing is to cover up uh, government Manchurian candidates, why are the patients all coming with, in with SRA stories? Well, that could be accidentally related and just part of a cultural hysteria and not real. The other paranoid conspiracy theory is that the um, intelligence agencies subcontract with the cults to prime the children to be good uh, subjects for men really, really complicated Manchurian candidates. Because if you just start with G.I. Joe at age 19, you can't, you know, get an intensely polyfragmented, multi, multi layers of defense system in place very easily. If you, so one of the pieces of logic I didn't mention is if you go back to J.H. Estabrooks in your Second World War, he's creating one alter personality in uh, adult recruit. Okay, let's look at the stage the computers are at in the Second World War and run up to 1996. We have to postulate that the technical advance and the increase in complexity in mind control research and operations has at least somewhat paralleled the complexity of artificial intelligence, all the rest of science, etc. So if they're still doing it, it's got to be a lot more complicated. And you've got to ha you, you can't get to a lot more complicated from a foundation of a normal 18-year-old military recruit. So that's the ultimate paranoid conspiracy theory. It's a matter of opening windows in the program. The first window that comes open is the SRA. The window behind that is the military mind control. Alternatively, the whole SRA thing could itself be delivered disinformation that's been implanted in the culture. Broaden the question a little bit. What's my political recommendation on what should be the legal liability of government-induced Manchurian candidates for criminal acts that they perpetrated? And I would say that we should have a double amnesty program. And this is for strategic reasons. And it's like politics is the art of the possible. Some people could say this is unethical and this is like, uh, you know, caving in and playing the game. I think that we have to have a double amnesty program for any criminal acts conducted by government-induced Manchurian candidates in the course of their government operations. And also amnesty for their handlers. Because if we don't have that, then the drive to keep it all covered up is too great. So we, we can't get this wound down. My basic argument is that I, I think this is, the intelligence community has been sold a bogus you know, bill of goods by these guys like G.H. Brooks and all his heirs down the line. That it's overkill, it's unnecessary, it's ridiculous. You can just drop it and there will be no operational loss. Do I know that for a fact? I haven't got the faintest idea. But that's what I would propose to them. They could do their own analysis. If we're going to stop it and let it come out into public, that'll never happen if the individual handlers and operators in the intelligence community are going to be nailed in public and personally responsible. So there has to be a double amnesty program, but then there has to be financial compensation for the victims who get identified. That is less likely to happen if the compensation comes out of the intelligence budget. Therefore, it ought to come out of general federal funds and ought not to reduce intelligence community funding. Otherwise, you've set up systemic disincentive to this stuff ever being declassified.